Welcome back to the Fast Life Podcast, everyone. Uh, last one for the month. <laughs> and as all the other ones are, this one is brought to you by Simpson Motorcycle Helmets. You can give them a follow on Instagram as well as check out their website, SimpsonMotorcycleHelmets.com. And I got some good news for all you painters out there that paint these helmets. After a lot of talk with them, we finally have uh, gasket kits. Now, gasket kits are basically all the rubber trim that go around the helmets. So the Mod Bandit and the uh, Ghost Bandit, you know, you painters out there can now order a uh, new rubber trim for the uh, bottom and the uh, eye port. So it's a, that's pretty good for us painters because that means that we can uh, do more layers on the paint jobs and make them more intricate. So good thing there. You can check it all out, SimpsonMotorcycleHelmets.com, as well as all the, br all the different styles of helmets they have and colorways and finishes and, and just they, they got it all. Everything you need for your head. Get them. SimpsonMotorcycleHelmets.com. Lexan Moto's FT4 Pro is out and available. You guys go check it out, LexanMotorcycle.com. The FT4 Pro is the first in the industry to have a patented utility light with SOS functions. Uh, the Type-C USB, which is the fastest USB charger on the market, up to 15 hours of music listening and battery life, with battery life, I don't know how to say that, <laughs> and up to 1.2 miles of intercom range with up to four rider conference. I mean, the shit's t it's top notch at a price point you can th th that nobody else in the industry can compete with. Check them out, LexanMotorcycle.com. Use Fast Life at checkout for fifteen percent off this already low price, and you can always give them a follow at LexanMoto on Instagram and see all the badass people wearing these badass products. <laughs> Thunder Max Performance ECM is de is designed specifically for EFI equipped Harley Davidson motorcycles, which is a standalone tuning system that utilizes proprietary auto-tune technology with wideband oxygen sensors to deliver unmatched performance and rideability. I am also running their oil cooler fan, which if you have a 2017 and up touring model, you can too. It's a small price for a noticeable difference in operating temperatures, up to 14%, I believe is what they, they say. Um, it installs in under 20 minutes and pairs right up with the Thundermax ECM. Also available now is the uh, heads up display, which gives you all your 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 readouts of your motor, so your air fuel ratio, your um, your your engine temperature, oil pressure, all this stuff, right there on your handlebars, uh, speedometer, RPMs. It even does like like fuel range, like how much fuel you're burning. You know, like in the newer cars. I don't have a new car, so I don't know what that looks like, but it's something like that. Check it out, thundermaxefi.com, as well as uh, wait. I fucked that up. It's Thundermax EFI on Instagram and shoptmax.com. Check out their products. John Jessup's Team Dream Rides is your go-to shop in NorCal for bike sales, bike builds, maintenance, and in-house dyno tuning. Stockton, California, it's right down the street from you. If it isn't, check out their website, teamdreamrides.com. They are bringing on new products every day and are offering 100 days, same as cash, financing on all products. All you need is a job and a bank account. And don't forget to use offer code FASTLIFE for 10% off. Give John and team and the team a follow at Dream Rides John on Instagram. Paint Huffer Metal Flake is the industry standard when it comes to flake. Check out PaintHuffer.com. Use Fast Life at twelve at for Fast Life twelve at checkout for up to ten percent off on everything on their website. They got all kinds of products, FBS tapes, uh, bringing on iWater products now, so it should be good. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that or not. Sorry, Brian. Anyway. Follow Paint Huffer Metal Flake on Instagram and stay up to date on all the product releases and all the works of art produced by many artists from around the globe. Big Bear Performance is the go-to for high-quality performance products for your FXR, Dyna, Softail, and Performance Bagger needs. Along with being the industry's leader in Olin's suspension sales, service, and tuning, check out BigBearPerformance.com and you can give Kevin a call and get the info from him himself at 909-479-7788. Hit them up, folks. And also don't forget to follow Big Bear Choppers on Instagram. What is up, everyone? We are coming to the end of the Phoenix run. This was uh, the last one here. It's FXR Division. Justin from Torch Industries and Big Chris. Uh, really good time. We had to cut the uh, interview or the uh, podcast short because I had to catch a flight, but these guys will be back on again. These guys are super awesome uh, people that I really enjoyed talking to. We had a good time. We actually talked for hours before the podcast, which is a no-no when you're trying to do these podcasts. But we did it. I fucked up. Sorry, guys. Good times. And like I said, this this is the last 
podcast that we recorded on our trip to uh, Phoenix. So I just want you guys to know how how much the the Patreon and, and you guys supporting our sponsors helps us do these type of things. You know, taking a, taking a week off of work and going you know to some other city or flying or riding or driving and and just racking up podcasts with with badass individuals such as like the one we're about to release. So. Go to our website, fastlifegarage.com. Donate whatever you feel comfortable doing. It helps us grow and do more with this podcast, like I've said many times. And uh, if not, you know, if you don't, man, it's I, it's cool. <laughs> Ain't nothing I can do about it. But I do appreciate you guys listening to this, and I would highly appreciate you guys to check out our sponsors. They are all people and brands and products that, that I know as bikers or painters that you can use. You know, it's not some bullshit people. These are, these are the industry leaders in what they provide and sell so check them out uh yeah i guess um here we are the end of the phoenix run i'm kind of kind of depressed a little bit now because i had such a good time there but anyway here we are big chris and justin from fxr division hey guys you ready to let the dogs out fast life Any, any like interview shit I've ever done has always been that. They put a little fucking mic clip on you and you just. It's, it's not like Justin with a ball of energy. We right. <laughs> got a lot better since then. I'm much better since then. You know, I haven't seen all the uh, all the episodes. You know, at the time when it came out, I was uh, I was heavy in the Big Wheel thing, so I watched the Big Wheel guys. Yeah. You know, and, and obviously, like in Texas, there was like, you know, the other people that when it gets misfit and shit, but. Um, like the Joey Hensley one from the Backyard Baggers. On the, on, didn't they go against, uh, what's that shop out there that's really known? They, they put on a show and everything now? Oh, uh, Prism? Prism, that's it right. Was, yeah, it was, it was Hensley, Prism, and uh, Matt Harris. For yeah. Down. Yeah, so that's cool. Yeah. Well, anyway, we're rolling. So. Hot damn. Finally. You know, there's, there's so many people here in Phoenix that I have to say finally with, right? Right. You know, like I've been through here a couple times, been trying to catch you guys, and. Uh, uh, not your fault. It's been mine because I'm the worst businessman when it comes to this podcast scheduling kind of shit. You know what I mean? So, but I appreciate you guys doing this and the hospitality so far, man. It's awesome. Absolutely, no we appreciate you giving us the opportunity. Cool. So, uh, you know, run through the basics first. We got to get to know you guys, the intimate details before the biker shit. You know what I mean? So, Justin, where you? What's your early, you know, influences in the motorcycling and getting into this kind of culture and business and things like that? Uh, I mean, all of my early stuff was all just kind of uh, automotive fabrication, whether it be hot rod or mm-hmm. low rider stuff or whatever. Uh, first real experience with motorcycle stuff, I don't even know that I could put a year on, to be honest with you. Maybe 2001, 2002, somewhere around in there. Oh, for real? So you're, yeah. you were still in that kind of earlier motorcycle mania kind of era kind of thing? Yeah, and that, that's probably where I really started to see a lot of it, I was doing fabrication stuff, but like I said, it was it was at that point it was all low rider or hot rod stuff. The okay. shop I worked at was a a body and fabrication shop, and that mm-hmm. was um, you know I was 13 when I first started there. Oh shit! Damn. I walked down there after school every day, and hell yeah, I worked there. And do you ever do you ever like jumping off real quick? Do you ever like notice that it's really rare to find somebody like that these days that will come into a shop and have that kind of enthusiasm and and, and energy to want to learn something so grueling <laughs> yeah we deal with it a lot we'll get people in here that over the years I, yeah. I, so much anymore i kind of just turn everybody away yeah unless i really feel like that person has something or really truly wants to be here or they kind of hang around for a while mm-hmm. it's kind of uh, like getting a bike club huh yeah yeah it kind of <laughs> is you know keep everybody at arm's length for yeah. the most part until yeah. you get to a certain stage where i'm like all right now well, you know the, the work ethic in people has right. changed so much yeah and especially in this industry and everyone wants the baddest shit for the cheapest amount of money Mm -hmm. you know the bolt-on parts this and that you get guys in here that think that they can do stuff and then he'll sit them down for like a weld test or something and they're Mm. just doesn't work out or they'll come in and and they have to sit in a chair for eight hours and just weld and they can't handle it yeah there's something I, i man that sounds fun to me right now just like as someone that appreciates welding and all that kind of shit but i'm pretty sure after eight hours of holding that torch and and feeding that rod in and everything it's probably going to be it takes a special kind of person it takes a special person yeah I'm full honestly yeah i can't do it, <laughs> it drives me crazy 
<laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hate doing the same shit over and over and over now. Like coming from someone who owns a company that all we do is production yeah. manufacturing for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, I struggle with it as well. So you know, I, I, I always like you know the, the creativity part of it is what I enjoy. So yeah. the figuring out how to get how to make things work and yeah. how to get that production product to a production point. Mm -hmm. That's what I enjoy. Once it happens, where we actually got to produce this shit. Yeah. <laughs> now you want to hand it off. <laughs> <laughs> so so you originally from here in Phoenix and everything or, or? Uh, well no I, I was born in Nashville and then when I was uh, I think. 10 or 11, mm -hmm. so 90, 91, somewhere around there. Um, my family moved to Tucson, Arizona, mm -hmm. and I was there throughout high school and all that. And then basically at that point, like I was doing tons of, you know, I worked at that at that shop doing mm -hmm. doing all that stuff, and I was big into um, adjustable suspension with hydraulics and oh yeah, I mean, she, and out that. here in the 90s, man, right? That was, that was it. Low rider capital, that was you it. know? Yeah, yeah. I was that was what everybody we were all doing. I said the shop I worked at, that's yeah, what it was, you know. What, um, what was our big shop out here? Like Reds Hydraulics or the Orleans? Reds, yeah, Orleans. Reds, yeah, Orleans, yep. Yeah. They're no longer here anymore. Yeah. Spin the mic around, just so it's like, other way. Other way. Yeah, there you go. Those yeah. were the two majors out here, and mm -hmm. that whole scene is just kind of diminished. Yeah. Yeah, Red still is around, the original owner still has the name, but it's you know, he does like, Low production stuff and or at least he died wouldn't sure, the hydraulics though itself ago. is just like a very old technology that's kind of being held it was on an by. aircraft it's an aircraft technology yeah so all your early like your your early like um i'm gonna draw a blank on it now i think it's all the uh, like the wheels coming down and shit yeah, or something yeah, yeah like the ask early asco stuff and and uh it was all like i said airplane hydraulics and then somebody except for landing gear things yeah. of that sort flap wings, all that mm -hmm. type of stuff. Somebody adapted it. Dude, knowing how hydraulics work. work and low riders and knowing that that's what's making this plane work, I don't fucking want to ride in that shit. Right, <laughs> right. Shit's catching on fire and leaking yeah. hydraulic fluid everywhere and right. shit. Right, yeah, when it was, it was all stuff that, the difference now is <laughs> they're running a bunch of batteries in series and you're yeah. running oh, you know, okay, okay, 72 okay. volts, you know, whatever, whatever it is, all those batteries in the trunk are all running in series. Yeah. And the reason that the shit catches fire is because it's not really, none of this shit's made to spin off of that. You're taking a 24 volt, uh, you know, pump motor mm -hmm. and spinning it at 72 volts or, or more. Oh shit, so you're just overpowering the pump. You're just huh? overpowering the shit out of it. Cause yeah. if you look at all the early stuff, like if you look at any of the videos from like the seventies, mm -hmm. like when they hit it, it's like you're watching the plane wheels come down because mm. it's just very slow moving so as like the front air, of it goes yeah, air uh, air up. Like yeah, air out like, of tank kind of thing. Right, yeah, yeah. cause they're running like a single, you know, a single, uh, like diesel 24 volt battery mm. in the trunk of the car as to where now like I said they're running a whole bunch of them in series so that's where you get the speed from and all that and mm. that's when it starts to get dangerous and you start to get fires and yeah, shit yeah. break in and everything else when you run it as it's intended to be run mm -hmm. it's fine it's <laughs> fine yeah yeah it's fine so what about you Chris man like what's your kind of uh, early days shit I mean I grew up as a skateboard kid mm -hmm. I was born and raised here in Arizona Ended up leaving when I was 19 or 20 and moved to Oregon. But all my early years here was just hanging out with my friends, skateboarding and punk rock music. And yeah. Shows and I was in a band in high school. And uh, and then I had some friends and their dads were bikers and stuff like that. And yeah. So I mean, you can see in the culture now, a lot of skateboard dudes, it was just an easy Transition. Yeah, integration, transition, integration. Wh whatever you want to call it, uh, into wanting to get into that because you're, I mean, it's it's, it's a subculture yeah. per se. It's kind and, of you grow up and evolve into this next section, you know, because I tried to skateboard. I used to skateboard a lot when I was a kid, but I tried to do it recently. And plus, I'm like 80 pounds heavier than I was back then. So, right. you know, catching a rock going straight and going forward like something's breaking with all this right. all moment. this meat going forward, on top of something forward <laughs> momentum yeah, yeah. but I, I dude I was uh, my wife uh, she works at this um, barber shop and all the dudes there are like same thing like punk rock kind of thing but kind of more Chicano shit you know what I mean and right. there's a dude there that has this legit ass mini ramp in the back of his house so we were over there for like Cinco de Mayo and I'm like looking at it in the corner like everybody's moving around and I'm sitting in the back of the, the, the fence going I can hit that. I haven't I haven't dropped in in fucking 15 years at least, and I didn't do it. Yeah. There's too many people I didn't know there. I couldn't make an ass of myself you right bounce there. Bounce your cheek off the bottom. Yeah, <laughs> boom. Everybody turned around. I'm like, I'm like, right. <laughs> but yeah, 
that's crazy yeah so that that's what sparked my interest and it wasn't until my mid to to late 20s that that i caught the bug a, a buddy of mine's dad owned a motorcycle shop here it's mm-hmm. called precision cycle works and it was one of those spots where you would go by i was pretty close to my house but you'd go by and the shit was open for like three or four days in a row mm. like 24 hours a day at night <laughs> the lights were on and sh- the shit was just buzzing and then all of a sudden it was shut down for like a week mm-hmm. like they were on some were, long ass run retired. and shit like that yeah and in the sign it was big old ss bolts and it is a pretty culturally mixed neighborhood mm-hmm. where the shop was so it was just crazy uh but my buddy's dad was the one that that started to build on my first bike which was a 79 shovel head yeah you know and i was really into it was 20 inch ape hangers and and it was a flt with stretch tanks and nice. a stretch rear fender it was like a it was like a hot rod low rider yeah type of shovel head and which is kind of what what i'm into i mean i got a old impala convertible <laughs> and it's it's got a stroked motor yeah sitting on bags with Craigers, you know, dude, Craigers is where it's at. So, man. you know, total white boy lowrider. What, 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 what lowrider? Like, what's the car or whatever? Oh, it's a '63 Impala nice. convertible, super sport. I want a '65, man. Yeah. And that, you know, I got a lot of uh, like Impala friends, and they always fuck with me because I was talking about this the other day. But uh, the '64, '58 to '64 is like the only Impala like most of the Impala world gives a shit about. Right. And I'm just like that '65, man. It had those little. I like the hot rod version of it more than the low rod version. What was the last year the, the three tail light? Yeah, set yeah, I love this. The, that's and, the only thing I like about that car. It, it went into kind of getting into that like fastback. Yeah, like the six, six, they're bitching, and shit. you know, like in the '60s cars, the '65 Impala would be the one on the Impala side. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm really into. I really want to get. I had a, a '66 Chevelle not too long ago. I, I really like the small body Chevys. Mm-hmm. I really want to do like a 67. Mm-hmm. The Unicorn 67 yeah. Nova. I said you want a Chevy too. Yeah. yeah. I had a 66 uh, Cadillac DeVille, the four-door one, and I thought I was just like, fuck, man. It's not a two-door, but it's still cool. But, dude, you when you roll those... Cadillac. Huh? Cadillac, you can get away with four doors. Yeah, so when you roll those windows down, it doesn't have that center post. Right. Fucking sick, dude just so dope and then there was this one that was rolling around Dallas out there it was hitting the shows just murdered the fuck out like everything and this is probably like back when like the skin industry shirts were like popping so everything was <laughs> Rob and Rob and Big were doing murdered out cars and it became a cultural thing across the country and shit right. but you know that's my only car thing I, after that I ended up like having a Honda Accord for oh, yeah. fucking so the last 10 for, years yeah. yeah some reliable well like, just the bikes man it's hard to it's hard to justify when you're when you have so many ideas on bikes and you're trying to like make all these things happen and then you're like you also have this dream of a cool car but it's just like fuck man like i just can't think of spending 20 grand on a car right now that's one of the big reasons i got away from the car stuff it's just so much work yeah you know and i'm i say I enjoy the creative process mm-hmm. and there's so much there's so much like <laughs> <laughs> there's so much time in between you right i have a real so right so you come up with an idea and you start to execute that idea and then you realize that on a on a car that takes months yeah at times and you can change your ideas in that, that time. too yeah things can snowball and get out of hand real yeah. quick which i still do it in the bike stuff too but you know i, I get to a stage where I, I just i hate this whatever it is that i'm working on mm-hmm. i'm gonna fucking burn this thing i yeah. give a shit less but you still got another six or eight months to go before yeah. this project's done, right? And that's kind of what it was like when you would like we would paint like the very big, big, crazy baggers, mm-hmm. where we were doing everything from like molding side covers together, um, body work, all this shit. Like you end up having three weeks in this project, and you haven't even got color on it yet, and right. then you have this long drawn out paint scheme and by that time you're already burnt on the damn thing, right? You know, and that, yeah, that's why one of the reasons I liked all the bike stuff a lot was was there's a lot more kind of free form creativity allowed mm-hmm. in it too. And kind of like, you know, we can do little artsy individual yeah. pieces that go with it. But you know, about the time that I reached that stage of, I hate this fucking thing. Mm-hmm. It's about time for it to come apart, you know, yeah. and go to get painted or powder coated or whatever. And then you have a little reprieve and then it comes back it all and comes back s- and you're 
yeah stoked yeah. again the fire is lit <laughs> and then about the time you hate it mm -hmm. you start it up and then you hear it run for the first time you can take this thing that you created down the road mm -hmm. and it's just you know yeah it's a, it's a much a shorter love hate process i guess yeah you're getting a quicker return on your investment of time and energy into something you know plus Correct. it's a lot less expensive to build yeah. a motorcycle depending yeah, especially too, though. nowadays yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe not 15 years ago but now right yeah yeah people don't account for the but with that said, technology I mean, brought into it the amount of money that that guys are spending on motorcycles right now too like i told myself a while ago i'm, I'm not gonna build another all in motorcycle because right, right. I could uh -huh. build a hot uh -huh. rod for the same keep cost. Lying. Keep yeah. lying to all of us. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, yeah, we, that we had that conversation like a year or two ago, and then I think we built a couple other bikes, and then we've got some pretty sizable personal slash business pro or uh, projects that we're going to be doing this year. So yeah, we I think we just tell ourselves that to, <laughs> to pacify sense. something and yeah. then it, yeah we're just it's, lying to ourselves we're in total denial yeah i, I would i guess liken it to being in a relationship with a crazy ass chick yeah yeah how so though you know you should get away from it but yeah you just can't yeah yeah or, I, or, I can't resist the first experience because or, or you, my you, get amazing it, you, and a, you you i get, don't deal with that shit but yeah <laughs> you get away with it and then from the outside in yeah I guess. And outside you go, perspective, you go somewhere perspective. else and and it's just not as fun or as right. boring because right and that's the thing yeah. you you have extreme highs and then extreme lows and there's nothing really in the middle and when you find something that's in the middle you're like fuck dude this is yeah. boring yeah the extreme yeah. when but the extreme highs are going on you hate them but then when the extreme lows are going on you miss them yeah well, you gotta you think like extreme highs. it's a type of it's a type of guy or man or whatever that, or that, that gets into this and wants to ride these waves. Right. You know what I mean? Because you, you, finding that middle ground is the most responsible thing you could do. Like maybe not doing this shit for a living, right? Yeah. And you, you get there and it's like it's not, it's not satisfying enough. But, but those highs and lows, I mean, I'm going to sound like Tony Robbins and shit right now, but those highs and lows is what make those highs and lows great. Because right. Right. you felt the top and you felt the bottom of, of that project. And that's why, you know, there's such a passion-based you know thing to work on bikes a lot of time if you're really into the shit well and that's a, that's another reason why you know in our industry and and having your own business is, is how we're surviving too because yeah a guy will get his first motorcycle and he'll have so much fun on it but then he wants to go faster or he wants to be able to hang his turns lower and, and just that constant push you know, they're, they're constantly upgrading, you know, and they're, they're evolving themselves as well as their bike and their experience on the bike. So it's kind of like it's I like to associate it to like playing a video game, a really good video game. You start off and you, your character sucks. But as you keep playing those those little level 32 and you get this new you, your heart, you hit harder now. Yeah. Those things make you want to keep playing it. You know, if you're a fucking nerd like me and stuff, but it's the same shit with what we do. It's yeah. just, just advancing your your ability or your next project. Yeah. Or so whatever whether you're else, building like, the bike or riding the bike, right? And, yeah. Or the you know riding, it could be just the experiences. Like you, you do this, and then you saw this, so this looks fun, and you do this, and you chase these things. Right. Yeah. So, riding motorcycles isn't something we get to experience all that much, but yeah, you know, we have the the enjoyment of of building them. And I don't know. To me, that's yeah. You know, I was I was kind of a really uh, un experienced guy in that thing where i thought like everybody that built bikes should have the same equal amount of time you, everybody should be riding the sturges and stuff and it wasn't until i started to really meet um very like talented individuals who build things and really looked at it as art that i could start to respect that they get their their kicks out of building that shit the way i get my kicks out of riding that shit but right, it's still yeah. all part of this culture you know what i mean yeah i enjoy riding motorcycles for sure but yeah. nowhere near as much as i do building them mm -hmm. and that's like i said you know that's something i learned i i, I came to understand because i just didn't get it at first you know yeah, well, you're evolving uh, you're leveling up you can hit harder now <laughs> <laughs> yeah then, then you just hit that that deal where you're constantly trying to budget your time yeah between that build you know we both have families kids that are doing homework now and fucking math anyone who has kids can understand fucking they've changed the whole like, way that math is done there's 
10 extra steps to doing a fucking addition problem. So a 20 minute page of homework is now taking two hours because yeah, you have to fuck. sit there and try to figure it out. You know, so trying to budget shop life and family life and, and, and having that balance there just makes it kind of hard yeah. to get on two wheels too and, and be able to get that. You time. probably feel a little selfish too if you end up taking that time for yourself to go just burn up to, you know, pacing or some shit like that, you know? Yeah, that's, that's where having, I mean, I, I have a great wife who she'll even tell me, she'll, like, you need to go do this and yeah. I'm gonna take the kids for the day and we're gonna go hang out with these people. You really should jump on a bike, call some people, go do some stuff. So she she understands that that's sometimes what's needed for for clarity. Yeah, you yeah. know, and and to get away from the monotony and shit like that. Yes, yeah, for sure. It is. It's cleansing. Yeah. Anybody who really gets into it, yeah. you know, it's a super cleansing experience. Mm. My problem is I can never have something together enough <laughs> to ride. Do you build a bike and then rob from it for a couple of months to get other projects done, and then have to rebuild your bike again? Yeah, we do that shit all the time. <laughs> Sometimes. I think Justin's biggest issue is, is he was talking about it earlier, he gets to a point on a bike and then he just burns out and then he'll come back to it and then he's, he realizes he's not happy with the Everything that 40 it hours <laughs> of fab work that he just put into one particular part. Yeah. So he's got to go back and redesign it mm -hmm. and and then it just it gets to that point where he just can't find that spot where he can just say yeah, the I'm, satisfaction I'm, I'm, part I'm, yeah. I'm cool with it being like this and yeah you know I can move forward yeah so it's a problem yeah. you were you were hanging out the shop that was kind of you know you were talking about the culturally diverse area that you grew up in and you know the shop and like so were you trying to get in there to start wrenching or just no not at all man I had no interest in it whatsoever yeah. I just you know I just the bikes were cool the fucking dudes were rough looking mm -hmm. you know again it's you're in skateboards and punk rock you don't really fit into the, the social norm mm -hmm. with the kids that are doing their homework or in band or 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 Jocks playing and sports like yeah. and all that other shit you know and you're kind of into that other stuff because that's where you feel you belong or you're accepted or whatever you know yeah. so you know there's that lure that and those dudes look fucking rad or you know mm -hmm. they, again it's 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 a culture that you want to try and experience and find out what it's really all about yeah and yeah. it wasn't until like i moved away and uh i lived in oregon and all i did up there was work and snowboard i i went to to college for a little while it was all on my own and uh i had an opportunity my buddy's dad that owned the shop there was a customer of theirs that they were starting a bike build for and they did all this work and then the guy couldn't come up with the money so they ended up just keeping the bike mm -hmm. so i had an opportunity to buy it and then kind of build it together and i'd fly back here on occasion and help do stuff you know at that particular juncture until it was yeah done and by that time I had ended up moving from Oregon to Huntington Beach mm. and so I was a lot closer and the commute was yeah. you know I can make it back here in five or six hours yeah that, that'd be a lot closer but that's that's what started the bug and after yeah the that, wrenching and shit like that yeah just, and just being on that bike you know mm -hmm. it was just a, like I said 79 cone shovel had what? some cams and some head work yeah what were you going to uh, uh, college for like what was your at that particular time, I was, I was doing just your general bullshit yeah, community basics, cla yeah. college classes, and then then I started, uh, I started going to school to try to be a paramedic, mm. but then I had a, a little trouble with the law when I was up there and realized that you can't be a paramedic with a felony on your yeah. record, so that crushed that dream, and I just went back to. Mm. To work Plus, in. Did you see those sausage fingers sewing up somebody? Yeah. No, it's not. It's plugging holes. They, oh, yeah. They're good at yeah. plugging holes. There you go. You can stick your finger in a bullet wound. There yeah. you go. I got it. <laughs> that's wild. So that's, that's pretty much how that worked out. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up moving back from Huntington Beach to here. It was either go back to California to Oregon, come back here. I came back here, and second bike came pretty fast after that. And mm -hmm. then I met a a group of guys on a ride and we all just clicked really well and one thing led to another and 
we ended up opening our first shop while I was working doing home loans for a bank and being a security <laughs> manager at a nightclub in Scottsdale. It's hard to see you as doing home loans for a bank. Then um, you go to your second job as a bouncer, which yeah. I can see, yeah, yeah. by the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm judging you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, if I, I showed you the pictures back then, dude. You know, yeah. it, it fit a little bit more, but yeah. this was... It's crazy because, you know what's weird? is like when I think... It, this, this, I don't know how to make this sound cool, but... When you see all the fucking bikers out here, not that they don't exist in, in Texas, but you see a lot of guys that are in the bike scene and fucking everybody's yoked, dude. Like everybody's like a big, and you go to Texas and it's like, you know, we have a different body out there, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, but you're also talking about, you're on the edge of Scottsdale bikers, right? Oh, so they okay. also got sparkly jeans and shit on to go with those oh, so, so, cool guy muscles. Okay, so they're over there. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's the more relatable yeah. crowd. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> no, that's wild, man. You know, um. Yeah, so you came back and you started doing this and you like found like a way to start turning some actual profits through working on bikes. I and would shit. even say profits, profits yeah. yeah. That's I mean the, 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 the God honest truth, if if and any guy that owns his own shop knows that it, it takes years to start earning profits in yeah. this business, you know, and and there's a lot of competition and there's just a lot of we we got more known for our parties and the lifestyle and all that other shit. I mean, sure we built cool shit, mm -hmm. but you ask anybody which bikes we built. So was this that shop the the foundry? Yeah, foundry, foundry, foundry Moto. Yeah. Yeah, I heard about that thing through story. So what was what was right, that yeah. world? Foundry was def there was never I don't think probably ever a profit made out of that place. It was fuck no. And le well, maybe on some parties you probably there was there was profit made on parties maybe, but yeah. But the amount of money, the yeah. amount of money that went into it, it was more just a. Like I said, it was. It was a cool guy hangout and. Party. Yeah, it was there was there was nothing like it. There's probably oh. never ever going to be anything like it. Mm -hmm. You know, it was it was a, a spot where, there was so many different genres and shit of people that that were able to come together and find like a common ground. I mean, yeah. we had, we had low rider guys there. We had. Uh, hot rock guys there we had like i don't know fucking greaser car club guys there motorcycle guys there hipster guys there fucking skateboard guys there because uh our buddy danny g's mm -hmm. is part of that and he's been around since day one on that uh so it was just everyone just came together at, at that spot yeah and, and we had bands fire breathers skateboard ramps we had an underground shooting range. We had a pet alligator, you know. <laughs> I'm a, one of the bikes that complete that, shit show. <laughs> yeah, that that, uh, that we did or that I own is sounds like a Sturgis attraction. Is what it sounds like. Oh uh, yeah, that was a, it. Was yeah, it was Phoenix's Phoenix's Coney Island. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah, that's a good one. You know, so it was, it was pretty cool. It was just probably like it, it, I guess it's probably hard to figure out how to turn a profit in a place like that when it really is based on just. If you're having, it's kind of like getting high on your own supply, right? If you're having fun at your place, then you're not making money at it, right? So. Yeah. That, another thing is there. There was, I mean, it was a group of us, and, and it was a group of young individuals for a while. Right. There was no adult supervision, so that was part of the problem. Yeah, and even <laughs> even the even even though we were adult aged, we didn't have adult mentalities. You yeah. know, we were just having such a good time, and we were just going with it is what it essentially came down to. So what year time, what time frame of year was this, like 2000s or? Yeah, or, or 2005 to 2008-ish. Yeah. yeah. That's so, cool. So three to four year run. That's not bad. Yeah, and like I said, I mean, some of the best times of my life, I, I met some of the best people in the industry and they're still friends today. That's cool. You know, and uh, they're a phone call away they can lean on us anytime we can lean on them it's it, i mean it, it was it was pretty fucking awesome you know what it what it actually brought to the table just on a personal yeah. standpoint because usually you see some of that stuff happen and when it's gone everybody just breaks and goes their own separate way yeah yeah you know where we were able to maintain contact and we well it's kind of cool like you said with Danny G you see like him go and or and he's doing his thing but he's still connected to that you know to this right oh yeah and who like is there anybody else that's still kind of in the scene oh yeah i mean uh like a lot of the the southern california center guys like uh chopper dave okay uh, yeah brandon from speed merchant 
shit uh, like a lot of us and <laughs> a lot of the yeah uh, yeah a, a lot of the guys that they've just it's been their life you know and they're super talented and they do super bitching shit and it's always progressive you know and it's the rad thing is it's 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 them Mm -hmm. it's not what everybody else wants it's it's just a they did what they wanted to do it's a total reflection of of themselves personally you know yeah yeah. and everyone can just associate with it and and enjoy it so was it basically like a bar thing or was it more of a i mean it was a shop a shop okay yeah we (laughs) we built shit yeah and 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 i I was i was on the you know basically on the outskirts all that that was yeah you know i was on the surface level of that i wasn't anywhere you know chris was full on part of it it was later on that i became mm. you know full into it part too. of the foundry stuff but it, it, it was all early stuff you know it mm-hmm. was that that time frame where where it was all pan head knuckle head mm-hmm. shovel head stuff and even at that shop uh it was my buddy rudy and i that that collaborated a lot on on all the builds and it was a carryover to this is we don't like to do the same thing twice Mm -hmm. so it was like every single bike that came out of there was just different yeah you know you can you can line them all up and know where they came from but you're not going to see a formula Mm. you know which is kind of what you see in the industry nowadays you know yeah so you're just like we literally build something different each time every single time a lot of stuff that was super influential to you know to the industry at that time Mm had a lot of heavy influence on me all the stuff that they were doing with you know the fabrication stuff that rudy was doing and just yeah. seeing the style of things that was going on over there was so how did how did like the torch industries thing come about uh i started torch in 2005 i guess was when it yeah officially started mm-hmm. prior to that um they said it was all automotive stuff and I was working at a, at a hot rod shop doing a lot of chassis work and fabrication and you know that type of stuff yeah and one of the guys there had a bike and we kind of started into that and again it was motorcycle I'd been watching the motorcycle mania stuff and the biker yeah. build off stuff and like I was super, just super the, intrigued by it's all gotta the be cool to stuff. see that but and know that you have the skills to do that yeah or, it, or you know you're on the path of being able right, to do that right know? yeah that probably right about when all that stuff really started to hit I thought I was really good. Yeah. And then I got a job at a shop that was actually good. Yeah. And then I walked in the door and had an extremely humbling feeling of nowhere near what you thought you were. Yeah, exactly. So I, I, that's one of the things I think it still sticks with me today is just that. <laughs> I very distinctly remember that sinking feeling mm-hmm. when I realized that, oh, wow, you thought you were a badass and you fucking suck. You got a long yeah. way to go. That When that happened to me, man, that shit was... Uh it's weird because when you're doing shit, like a lot of your close friends and shit, you're like, dude, you're good, man, you're good. Right. Everybody's right. like that. And then you're like, you know, if someone says, oh, man, this kind of, it's just kind of weak, you're like, oh, this motherfucker's hating on me, dude, because I'm just doing so good. You know, right. my future's too bright. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Right. But then, um, you know, when you, like, as time passes, then you see that, that project you did or you look back on it and see it in, oh, yeah. in our heads or on our phones at the time or whatever we kept our pictures at the time, you see it. Yes, it definitely wasn't phones. Yeah, so <laughs> you're on your computer <laughs> looking at a, you know, five megapixel pi- uh, pixel picture. Right. Um, you know, it's you badass see, when it's all green. Yeah, it, yeah. You're like, fuck, man. I remember this thing being so sick because you were stoked when you did it. But then you run into that project or that bike or paint job. And you're like, fuck, man. Like, I didn't know how to pinstripe. That bitch looks like she has Down syndrome. You know what I mean? <laughs> like all this shit like rushes over you and, and it right. makes you. And then, then I think is where you find out like, fuck, man. I need to be a little more humble about myself. Yep. in certain stages of my uh, of my paint work and right. what I do. Well, so. that's one of the things that it, it, it baffles me too with some of these guys. Like with social media shit, obviously it's so easy to portray something that you're not. Yeah. But you get all these guys out there that just have, they seem to have this great opinion of themselves. But you're looking at it, like, I, no, for yeah. one, like not trying to be a dick, but there's so many more people out there that are better than you. And you can see them. They're probably in your feed. Like, how are you looking at what you just posted? And you're like bragging about yourself or whatever or, or your knowledge like you yeah, know it yeah, all you know all this shit and then you scroll two pictures down and there's a real bad motherfucker right there that just posted some shit yeah. you can't see the difference in that like I don't know yeah, well, I, think, I get it, it, it yeah. <laughs> I think with that I, I see that regularly is, in my own feed I'm like oh that's a, that shit looks pretty good yeah, whoa with, never mind that looks that yeah. actually looks good with that said I think 
like we didn't have social media back then. Yeah. Right. Like you didn't have social media. You didn't have really shit to compare stuff to. Now, dude, it's it, it's a finger swipe away. You can you can compare two pictures in 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 point three seconds and yeah and see some really talented shit versus some mediocre shit. You know. Yeah. And so I th- I think it's it's I'm not a huge fan of social media. Obviously, yeah. you, you can tell by our, our Instagram deal. We're, we're not. <laughs> like the hugest posters or whatever like that yeah. where we're just constantly fucking cramming shit down people's throats but but it it's a good way to hold yourself and other people accountable mm-hmm. at the same time because you get these guys that are just, I mean there's a shit ton of talent out there that you never knew was out there yeah. and now you can see it because they're posting shit but those guys that are posting super rad shit you look at like their comments or or their their little their little information about it and it's super minimal yeah because their work speaks for itself yeah and then you look at this mediocre shit and it's this long drawn out like a, a full-on story of the evolution of how this particular piece or how that yeah. came apart it's almost like you're, they're trying to talk you if you take the time to read it they're trying to <laughs> tell you it's badass you know, like we were talking about, it's, they're, they're trying to validate to, why they're there. Yeah, they're trying to validate everything that you're seeing, but you're not seeing the the quality. Right. But the words are there to try to uh, spruce it up, I guess. And by no means am I am I like talking shit about the guy that's posting like mediocre because everyone has their own opinion and stuff like that. Well, you all got stages of progression to yeah. your ability. Yeah, and it gives you something to to work for. Right. If you use it for a format to better yourself and stuff like that take constructive criticism, etc., yeah. and and move forward. Don't think that everyone's just fucking hating on you, you know? Yeah. Somebody it, might just be giving you, hey, this is what works for the, me. And the way I like cr- c- uh, constructive criticism is when someone sees it and they like me or like what I'm doing, they see something I'm doing that's not as good or is not accurate. I like it when they take the time to message me instead of like, Right. You did it wrong, fag. You know what I mean on the yeah, fucking right. uh, comments and shit. So yeah, there's a, there's a tactful way yeah. to do it. You don't need to put it in the the right. stream feed so that you know yeah. you look like a dick or like you're patronizing the person that just. I mean, because to them, whether, whether it's still, mediocre or not, they they probably yeah. they put a lot of work into it. Yeah, you know, and a lot of themselves into it. So you can't take that away from them. Yeah, I'm so. not I'm not trying to downplay the the work. I'm just I'm saying more like when these people are are. They're putting up mediocre work and they're portraying it and trying to sell you, like you said, that it's some badass shit. Yeah. Like I put up some shit that I like. That looks, you know. I, and, and when you look back, you're like, oh man, I shouldn't have done that or whatever. Yeah. But I, I feel like I did it in a tactful way or whatever. And if you put it up there, like, hey man, just way. yeah, in a humble way. And, it, and you you're not like I said trying to oversell it or trying to pat yourself on the back. Like there's way too many motherfuckers in this industry that have long ass arms and are real good at patting themselves on the back. Like, just be humble about it. Just understand yeah. that. You know, if you post something you think it's good, be proud of it. Yeah. But also understand that it could be better. Yeah. No matter what it is, it, it could be better. be better. It, it has, has to be better, right? Yeah. If you you have to progress. Yeah. None of us are perfect at any of this shit. Mm-hmm. It's all a progression. So what you posted this week, what you post next week, better be better than shit you posted this week. Because mm-hmm. otherwise, you just. And I saw that happen in the industry too. Whenever I saw guys like, um, you know, not not saying that like Joe Martin is fall, fell fallen off or anything like that. He's still very badass painter and everything but as far as paint progression like when he would airbrush stuff it's like his style or his airbrush work hit a peak and never evolved past that it was like he it was his comfortable zone i'm not going to try to make my shit more detailed or more cleaner or anything it was just bad it's still badass but it just like he was somebody that i watched and then i felt like at some point i kind of surpassed him in certain areas of 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 like airbrush and some graphics and things but i think once you once you get caught trying to do shit for the masses where Mm -hmm. that's where your concern is that's that also becomes the crutch Mm. because then you're losing your passion because all you're doing is you're trying to make all these people happy instead of instead of doing it for you because i mean you we're all our own worst critic so we're always the hardest on ourselves but if you're always constantly striving to do the best that you can fucking do for you yeah and then and then make it available to other people that's where the shit comes out the best instead of oh man i think everyone's gonna like this so i gotta this is what i'm gonna do you know the catch 22 of that is those guys that are trying to build shit for the masses 
those are the guys that got the money. Yeah. And we're yeah. a bunch of broke asses. Yeah, <laughs> but hey, we love what we do, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, you know, it is like different. It's like you think about everything that you do as a fabricator and stuff, and there's always those other skills that you might be good at. Like, I'm good at social media, too. I'm good at talking to people that have lots of money and convincing them that they should put a lot of money in my hands. Or you're not. You might be good at, you know, something else unrelated to that. So you see some guys that might be okay at wrenching and they might be okay at taking this part they bought from you and drilling some holes in it and doing something else and calling it theirs, right? right. Um, but they might be better at just bridging that gap between the real money in the world and this kind of dirt baggy kind of lifestyle of a biker and thing. You know what I mean? I understand that though. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's, don't don't try I, to be you, right? <laughs> right. I say, I say it all the time. Like, at this point in my life, I, I, I'm very self-aware of who I am and who I'm not. Yeah. I'm not a salesman. I'm not the most social person. Yeah. You know, a lot of people label me as an asshole mm. just because I'm typically, I'm not the person that's going to walk up to you and just start a conversation and want to talk. Like, I'm yeah. perfectly fine with leaning against a wall by myself. Mm-hmm. Fine with that. A lot of people, just they just don't understand that. As like I said, just labeled as an asshole by yeah. a lot of people. Whatever. What's always I don't, better? I, don't yeah, care. I, I wish I had that more... Uh, that more bravado towards me that way I wouldn't you know because it's cool because no one really knows you yet like yeah. it's, it, it's okay. like until you start talking so you start throwing shit out of your mouth then you give them everything to judge you by or understand what you're about you know what right. I mean right right so. but it's but I don't ever try to I don't, I don't feel that I ever try to sell myself as something mm-hmm. I'm not yeah. like I'm not going to I'm, you know I'm, like I said I'm not a salesman I'm not that super customer service oriented person but I'm not going to tell you that I am yeah so on the flip side of that, if you are a, a person that's great at making money and great at, at, at selling widgets or whatever whatever your shit is, yeah. don't tell people, don't stand next to this creation and scream and yell about how you did it. Yeah. And pat your, again, use your long ass arms to pat yourself on the back and not not mention anything else or anybody else that, that put heart and soul into that creation, yeah. right? I don't do any of this shit by myself. Chris doesn't do any of this shit by himself. We all do this. We do all of it together. Yeah. We all have, we understand our strengths and we understand our weaknesses. And I'm not going to try to play out, say his strengths are my strengths and, you know, yeah. my strengths are his strengths or whatever. We understand that we're good at things and I'm not going to take the credit for what he did. He's not going to take the credit for what I did. And that's how it goes across the board yeah. for us. I, I'm perfectly fine with, with bringing, hey, I didn't make this piece, this badass piece that everybody's freaking out about on this motorcycle that we built. You had to make that. This guy did. Yeah. Yeah, we're... we're that's that's kind of one of the benefits to, to this partnership. Not all partnerships work that way. Yeah. But we both understand where one is deficient and where where the other is is good. Mm-hmm. And we don't argue with about that. We don't we don't try to step on each other's toes with that. We work together. And when you hear us talk, it, it's it's always a we thing. It's not an I thing. Yeah. You know. And you hear a lot of these guys. Honestly, I think there's maybe one or two guys in this industry that can that can legitimately take something from absolutely nothing and build something unbelievably amazing from scratch by themselves. Yeah. One or two guys, you know? And there was a dude in Born Free a couple years ago that built a fucking, made a motor or some shit like that? Or yeah, was, that, that's, that's happened, I think, a few times. Yeah. But yeah, the guys, yeah, they cast all their own shit and everything else. That's insane that, that's I don't have they, the patience for that yeah and, and over the years I've been trying to catch myself whenever I say like oh yeah I built that bike I, I try to correct it and say like oh I customized that bike you know what I mean and and not that I'm like super hard on for like you're, you're not a builder because you didn't do this but I do respect the guys that do do it and I do understand why it would bother them to to have that line of I'm a builder blurred between him and me when I'm not welding I'm just painting and, and modifying parts, you know what I'm saying? Right. So Yeah, but also it's all left up to where do you draw that line between customizer and builder. Yeah, it is. Yeah, there, that's it's a huge gray area in yeah. between. Like if you're if so if you're not hand making every single piece, does that make you not a builder? Yeah. So if if we make the frame, we make all the sheet metal, everything involved, but we don't build the motor, does that negate does that yeah. negate one as one builder, aspect, yeah, or you know, in comparison to the other, but again, that's also the, understanding that and knowing same, your strengths and weaknesses. That's the same argument builder. of like, okay, well, there's also somebody who knows how to make tires, 
Correct. So, that's what I'm saying. You that's, know what I mean? When it, when it gets down to it, like, you know, an argument made years ago, like when they were doing that, the when Jesse James was building against the other idiots, I forget who they were, but uh, the uh, OCC the, guy. And, and the gas monkey shit. Yeah, the gas monkey shit, which, you know, OCC now has some pretty legit guys over there. Um, I haven't seen the new shows. Is, I haven't seen it yeah. either, but, you know, I know a couple of guys that are on there and they're super badass fabricators. Yeah, you yeah. Know, Ryan Grossman is a, he's a bad dude. Mm-hmm. You know, and so they've got some legitimacy. It's not the kid with a cut off wheel and a grinder and yeah. building some round bar together. And a bunch of arguments. Create, create, I wonder if they still do that shit. shit. Ah, I'm sure. But, you know, the <laughs> argument was Jesse James was trying to say that, oh, I handmade all this shit, whatever. And it's like, where do you draw the line, though? Like, he's blacksmithing, he's doing this, but, like, are you also. Are you going to go, you know, mine your own iron ore and make your own <laughs> steel? Like there, there is a line where it has to. Has to granted, in comparison to all those guys, yeah, Jesse blows them all out of the water. There's no, for sure. However you feel about the guy, when he it comes it. to skills and it comes to his his just wanting to continue and and grow his yeah. skill set. I think bad motherfucker is like like you're getting at. I don't think that you can actually define that. It's it's hard because it's going to be based on like the opinions of the masses. Right. You know? I don't think putting a bunch of fiberglass shit on a motorcycle and painting it wild colors makes you a bike builder. Agreed. But there was a whole 10 year industry built off of it. Yeah. Now inside of that, there were a lot of people that were doing some badass shit. Yeah. Making, but you wouldn't know because those are the guys that aren't standing up screaming with fuck again, patting yeah. themselves on the back and talking about it because typically, you know, we always talk about, you have your sayers and your doers. You know, you know, I also think that, like, it wasn't so much that, that, like, we as individuals called ourselves builders. I think it was the, possibly the thing of, like, the, the Discovery Channel just throwing the name Builder, 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 and then that became the best way to describe what you what anybody that works on a bike is. You know what I mean? Right. When, because I would meet people that are just mechanics. They have no idea how to visually make a bike look good. And so, the, is a mechanic more of a builder than a painter? You know, and then you right. get into the, like a lot of these questions where you ask back and forth because I would, you know, I, I went through a, re- re- a really weird part where I would customize a bike and I would feel very confident about it or proud of it at least, you know, and not get the same kind of love because I'm a paint shop and I'm not really looked at as a guy who customizes bikes, right. even though I've done it and did this and did whatever, I've done my way, my, my version of it. And then... Some dude that had to pay a painter, had to pay a, a powder coater, had to, you know, have a mechanic in his shop, had to do all these other things. He's more, uh, you know, of a, of a builder than me. And I, I did this. I coated my motor. I painted everything. And, you know, I'm honing out fucking powder coat to get it to fit a good, you know, all these different things, you know. So, yes, there's so many different facets of it. Yeah. And it, that too, I think when you say with like the Discovery Channel coming in and, and making it kind of like a, a, a popular term and muddying those waters. Yeah, and, yeah. Similar to, I guess, a, a reality show. Shit started out actual reality. Now it's all yeah. a scripted reality, but the average person doesn't understand that it's a, what the difference is yeah. or that it's all scripted. So the same thing. So well, same. It, it comes in, you got actual builders being on all these building, building shows, and then it goes to a point where it's just, you got a figurehead who's the salesman and who's the good person at yeah. talking about who's the audience yeah right and he, he's a he's a, a, a sellable individual you know, yeah dude you've been in front of the cameras is it you know that same show you were on like I've said a million times on here we did a pilot for that show mm-hmm. and I could not I, could, I just couldn't do the look into the camera and talk to it I just couldn't do it you know like if if you're sitting <laughs> did you do it or not <laughs> yeah we had to sit and look and it, it was my first experience of that like yeah. I did magazine interviews and and things of that sort before but never anything like that to where you're sitting and and it's it's always leading questions and you have to the, the, the audience can't hear the person that's asking you the yeah. question so they can't hear the question so you have to answer everything by as if you're start, as you're, you're just <laughs> stating like you're, you're including yeah. your you know subconsciously including the question in the answer yeah yeah so it took that has to take quite a yeah bit that's of, a fucking skill in itself right there right. You and know? then they ask you dumb fucking questions yeah when it almost like if they, they would kind of like work with you and just say hey we need to get this point across what do you think the most accurate way of or, or authentic way as being no, a fabricator they, would no be? they thought they knew everything about everything yeah. and they wanted you to do it their way 
Yeah. Which is why by, by the end of it, the producer fucking hated me. <laughs> you wanted to come in and like light shit on fire and all this other yeah, crap. They wanted, like, they wanted the to create drama. Yeah. yeah. And, and another thing, I mean, if, you, if you've ever watched that, a majority of, of Justin's part in that, it's all profile shots. Unless they, unless they have him sitting down and they're doing an I'm interview. I'm going to go watch it. I'm actually I'm going to download it on process. my iPad and watch it on the way it's, home in a minute. best TV you've ever seen in your life. Yeah, he's not, he's not like engaging, playing, <laughs> playing the, the, hey, let's create some drama or hey, let's do this. or yeah. It's just him. Yeah. And so all they, all they could pretty much do is show him working or show everyone else working. Yeah, everyone working, yeah. yeah. It, by the end of it, they, they showed up on the last day. And we had finished the bike the day before, uh-huh. and it ran. Everything was done. Yeah, and we did that bike in 24 days, which was just a pain in the ass. Retarded, yeah. yeah. And it, it took it took legitimate 24 days, but mm-hmm. it took three months of me setting everything up beforehand and getting yeah the engraver ready, getting the polisher ready, and some of that shit. Like I had a mock-up motor, so we busted the motor apart and had set it, it off to be somewhere. polished and engraved and. Yeah, ready to go back together, but you know, I had to build a frame. I guess we even talk about this. We're talking about the Biker Live series. It was on about what eight, six years ago. It was like five, five years. This yeah. April would be it twenty. It was six twenty years. Four. Yeah, yeah, it was recorded in thirteen. I think it released in four. No, it was in fourteen. It released in fourteen. It yeah, it was in fourteen. We yeah. we filmed like two months before it released. Okay. Yeah. We filmed in April and it released in June. That's right. Yeah, because so, we did our pilot in December. Of thirteen, we did our we did our, our like our film, test film, all that kind of shit, like in in December, January, November, December of okay, thirteen, yeah. and then it actually filmed in fourteen. But yeah, they, they showed up and they were mad because the bike was done. Well, you came, that, you came to a a professional, you know, an, an allegedly professional <laughs> shop here, and you're mad that we got it done on the time we were supposed to get it done. So they were like, "Well, we need to take the fenders off." Fuck you. Not happening. Yeah. Oh, well, can we take the exhaust off? <laughs> Absolutely not. You know how much of a pain in the ass it was to put on? <laughs> well, what can we do? It's like, I'll pull the seat off. So that's why you see in the thing, like, come walking in. Oh, got it, the seat, man. Yeah, let's put it on. Drop the, drop the seat on. Put the single bolt through the seat. Kickstart it and fire it up. That's We'd the same test thing that was happening with Brian, was though, right? Brian was finished, and he had to, like, fabricate. Like, there wasn't any gas in it or something. Yeah, they shit. pretended that. Yeah. I think, I think Mark was the... Poor bastard that got the blame for that one. <laughs> that, oh, Mark, you dumb son of a bitch. You forgot to put gas in it. And Mark's actually an awesome, super intelligent guy. And that's yeah. not something that he would, the, would do. The, then they kind of like, I don't think those producers thought about like, you know, how the rest of the industry might take that person. He might be forever if it was a popular show, well, be known as like the inc- incompetent, you know, bike guy because right. of something. Well, that was like that. that was the uh, constant argument that happened yeah. during the whole thing. It's like selling your soul. Well, yeah, they're like, we want to light this on fire. No, we want to do this. No, the fire said, what can we do? Like, listen, here's the deal. You guys are here for 30 days and they were only there one day a week through the whole thing. And every day they were there, we didn't get shit done because it was all the lights were off. They had their spot lighting and we just take and do this and do this and move this. And okay, we go do these stupid riding shots and on other bikes and all this. So they can have an intro and all this other dumb shit. Every day they were there was a completely lost day. Mm -hmm. Nothing productive happened. And, you know, I told him, I said, when we get to the end of this, you guys leave and go about, you, you're going to go on to the next thing, the next series, the next whatever. Mm-hmm. We're never going to see each other again. I'm still going to be in the same space, the same industry in front of the same people for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't give a shit about your, your drama and your cool shots and whatever else. Like, that means nothing to me. Yeah. My integrity, the, you know, the, my brand is what matters to me. So when you're gone, you're not going to give a shit about me. So why do I give a shit about you when you're here? Yeah. And it was just it was just a constant fight. I would think that like Jesse James did it well when he did the motorcycle mania because he didn't really he let the natural drama of just when you're out on a road on a chopper. You know what because I mean? Because there there was no there was no guidelines. Yeah. They were making it up as they went. They didn't know what worked and what didn't. And it didn't. fucking worked well, dude. It worked well, but there there I was told to me like that they're, they're worried about you know uh, you know Midwest Jane or whatever at her house sitting at night after the kids go to sleep. They want her to have something that she can relate to in this show. Like, I don't give a shit about her. 
I'm trying to get, I'm trying to be like a hot like, dude. Yeah. Her dude ain't hot. Right. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. Whatever. Like, <laughs> why do I care about some, you know, some lady who doesn't know yeah. shit about motorcycles, doesn't care about the motorcycle industry for, you know, like they're just worried about TV ratings. They're worried yeah. about sellability and that they can sell across the board. That's yeah. all they care about. They don't care about the, the actual product. All they care about is the, is the end result gets numbers. Mm-hmm. People make money and they move on. That's it. I don't care about what's going on in the actual motorcycle industry. They give two shits. Yeah, yeah, that's obvious. Yeah. It was obvious sitting in there because they were they were trying to pit my feud I was telling you about earlier. They were trying to get us to go after it. I actually got the video of him talking shit about me because the, they it was on. They put it on a YouTube thing and I copied it, so I have the clip of where he's talking shit about me wearing my old shop that that I end up having to sell my shares out of because uh-huh. of all kinds of other drama. And it's like. It was the whole thing, and they wanted me to just say "fuck him" and or "screw that guy," and then throw the middle finger at the camera. And I was like, yeah. "We're not cool, but you know, I'm. I just, I still respect the guy, and I'm not going to do that. I'm sorry. Right. And, and plus, I don't. I'm not a middle finger thrower. Like every time I, you know, when someone kind of comes up with you a camera, and you're like, John Shope did it to me the other day on the bike. He's like, "Hey, ride the soft tail. See how you think." And he walked up to me, and I didn't fucking know what to do with my hand, so I was like, "Shut." Should I do the John Schultz finger, or should I, should I do a hell yeah, or should I just do a thumbs up, or I just kind of threw, a, a, you know, a, a retarded hand up in the air if we right. could say that, and, right. just, and then I just went and I said, let me ride the bike. You know? right. <laughs> I'm so awkward sometimes, man. Yeah. <laughs> so shit, man. So at, you know, before that took place, you know, you had to have already kind of created something within yourselves to actually be selected for that. So what was some of the shit going on? 2008 to 2000 you know 13 oh in the early days of of torch it was kind of whatever like i still had a i worked at another place and i wasn't working in the motorcycle industry in the beginning of it and then i kind of progressed into the motorcycle industry Mm -hmm. um but you know in the early days it was just more of i had too much equipment and projects for the for the house i lived in just in the garage Mm -hmm. and you know another guy that i spent a lot of time with at that point was uh, you know he was into all the same shit that i was into so we just rented a space and yeah you know it was but it was basically just people brought other shit and i worked i you know cut weld grind (laughs) on all these other people's shit you know for pennies on the dollar thinking i was going to get rich and then i get to the end of it i'm like how do i owe you two thousand dollars how does this even work (laughs) so for you like was uh your vacation was it in the 2000s or more recent or my vacation yeah (laughs) oh my uh actually was i went on vacation shortly after it was 14 november the beginning of november November 14 it was was, yeah, was the I, ironically, ironically, the federal building is two blocks away, uh-huh. and we were over here at Van Buren, so you could step out of the shop, look right down the street, and there's the federal building. So that's where you were. Well, yeah. that's yeah, that's where, that's where all the, I had to go to court and then <laughs> say my goodbyes and yeah. and whatever. So yeah. it's just it was just looming because that that all that shit started at the end of 13 yeah and so carried on all through 14 and uh and th- that whole time we're we're sitting here trying to grow like the fxr division business oh that was so that was started prior yeah to this. it started prior yeah it was basically in 2013 is when the business uh, officially started where like the LLC and all that bullshit was so formed. It was probably was, 2012 that we were actually because he had two twin cam FXR projects. That, so what was the uh, like how'd you fall into the FXR thing from so, all the other areas? So uh, toward the tail end of like the foundry moto shit uh, it, we, I, I was part owner of the building um the other guy that I was partners with, when I got involved in that building, I, I just didn't do my due diligence and get all the information. It, it turned out it was on like a, an adjustable rate mortgage where you could pick your payment and shit like that. I bought into that particular building and it was his responsibility to be making the payment, not knowing that it was, they were just making the bare minimum payment. Mm-hmm. And then the market took a shit, you know, and he was that type of guy that was always oh you know we're, we've got this much money in in equity this and that type of shit well the property value went well below the loan amount and it just didn't make any financial sense to keep it 
So we, we stayed over there as long as possible. Danny G was actually living in the house that was on the property. Uh, and he had an FXR and uh, he's back and forth from Oceanside because yeah. for, for his, his job and shit like that. But that's what kind of started it. And then uh, I bought an FXR off of a buddy of mine in Southern California, Jose. He's a fucking super rad dude. Uh, it was funny because he had it for sale and I'd, I'd known him for a while. And I get there and he's also got this 54 Bel Air, super fucking bitching two door. Yeah. And I, I walk in, I was like, he's telling the story, he's going to take it to Bomona to, uh -huh. to sell it at the swap. I was like, well, fuck, let's make a package deal Yeah. type of deal. And I mean, he's a tight ass and he likes, he likes to, <laughs> he, he, he likes that, that back and forth. Like, oh, he, he wants to play the gas monkey guards thing. Yeah, no, I mean, no he just, he's, he's much, he's well above that. Yeah. He, he just, he enjoys the buy and the sell. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Everybody knows that Jose don't keep shit. Yeah. If he yeah. keeps something for a while, it's a, he fun. says he's going to keep it. Yeah. Everything then, he's going to keep, but you know, keep it. it does, yeah. He doesn't keep it that long. <laughs> But it came down to, we were like within a thousand dollars and uh, he was a friend at the time, he was with us and he talked us into flipping for it. It was just a thousand dollars. Yeah. But fucking Jose won. <laughs> and I was bummed about it the whole fucking time. And well yeah, once you flip then you're agreeing to one or the other yeah. for sure. So anyway, I, I, I ended up leaving there with, with, I think it was a 93 FXR and a 53 Bel Air. Mm. Which I still have. Yeah. Fucking love the shit out of the car. My kids love the shit out of the car. Yeah. I mean, that's our like little family driver. Yeah. I want to uh, get something like that for me and my wife and kids. Yeah. It's super, super rad. Uh, Buy something done. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because I, I yeah I ended up putting a bunch of work into it, but nonetheless got the FXR back here and and it's just not my thing to to keep shit stock or yeah. keep it original or or i like to keep it original but i like it super clean what year was this 93 oh the, no the, 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 the when you got the fxr 2010 so what was what was the customizing what was the style to customize them like oh it was it was straight fucking club style that so was like quarter the, that was, type that was shit. like the, the the apex of the sons of anarchy true, true. Yeah. fucking West Coast T bar, Arlen Ness fairing type of shit because it was pre T sport fairing and yeah. all that other stuff, you know. So I ended up just tearing the whole thing down and redoing the whole thing, just murdered out. But I I rode that thing back and forth to California, just you know multiple times, and I'm at, we, I I title them chopper killers because if you if you start on a chopper and stuff like that and you ride choppers, kick only four speed rigid mount bikes and then you jump on one of those bikes. You can basically hit a button and ride across country, mm -hmm. you know, shaking your legs out every couple hundred miles, yeah. you know, and not have to worry about making it to your destination, you know, yeah, exactly. and they fucking handle and, you know, you, you get as much speed as you want to put into the throttle, yeah. you know, so that's, that's kind of what, what started it. And I just fell in love with those particular bikes and the way that they felt, the way that they handled the, the way that they looked when they were set up, mm -hmm. the shit you could still do on a performance side. At, at that particular juncture, there wasn't a shit ton of them out there because everyone was on the Dyna craze. Uh, so I ended up buying a 2001 FXDX uh, T-Sport from uh, a, an old buddy of mine, English Tony, if anyone lives yeah. in Oceanside, they know English Tony, he's a fucking stud. Um, and I stripped that thing down and spoof stabilizer set up. It was an 88, put a, a 95 kit in it, mm -hmm. got that thing all dialed. So I had the FXR and the Dyna and I just couldn't get away from the FXR. Like yeah. I rode the Dyna and it, even with all the shit that I had done to it to try to get it to ride like an FXR, it didn't ride like an FXR. Yeah. Had this weird little shimmy and then it you'd get up to a certain speed and you got this this wobble you'd have to throttle through yeah. or let off, you know? And, and pray. <laughs> so I fucking eighty six that thing. Yeah. And then uh Where'd that thing go? 
Oh, you know where that thing went. It ended up on the cover of Hot Bike Magazine with somebody else riding it. That guy knows who he is, too. Uh, uh, we, won't, we won't mention any names. Yeah, he knows. He knows. Uh, but then after that, you know, I, I ended up meeting this really cool uh, old, he's an old Forestero. Yeah. Skip Taylor. Mm. He, he lived here locally, but he did a bunch of R&D for s and and stuff like that. And, uh, was he the guy that rode around everywhere on the SNS stuff, or was it maybe I'm not another guy? I don't know. Like he would like go put miles on the SNS motors to make sure they're yeah. And he did a lot of track time on them too. That's probably it. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably heard of the guy from. Yeah, I mean, he was fucking. He was just a stud. Tons of history. Mm-hmm. Like David Mann was one of his best friends. Wow. You know, he was. He's one of those four steros. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I met him at, we had a mutual painter friend, Crash, who's local to us. You used and to work I, with Mike Learn, yeah. Yeah, and I was I was getting some paint work done and Skip rolls up in this fucking orange RT right there is the, the windshield, the original windshield from that bike. And we used to just start chopping it up, became friends just from that one little interaction. Yeah. Uh, and then I get a call a couple weeks later from Crash that you know, Skip's got some projects. He's thinking about selling his RT, and I had to jump on it because it was. Yeah. I mean, it was just done. He had a 124. Oh shit. Had a five speed in it, but he had a SNS six speed in a box. Mm. You know, the fucking paint was like nobody had ever seen before. Uh, it was just badass. So I broke down and I bought the thing, mm-hmm. and then uh, I, when I bought it, you know, he agreed just to put the six speed in it for me so that when I picked it up I just it's ready to go it's ready to go so you you started basically getting this FXR fever basically and you started exactly kind of uh, like trying to align it to a business or align it to a direction like what was the idea for FXR division as far as like what was going to be the the was it going to be the parts line or was it going to be more of a service place or no it was it was, not really an idea initially it was just a cool name we just came together <laughs> to, to help you know to try to finish up some of his like his two twin cam projects or it was really one twin cam project at that point right yeah I, you know with me shit just opportunities happen shit snowballs and before you know it one twin cam fxr becomes two twin cam fxrs you know it, it was we had one uh that was a 114 with the, with a bigger seven speed it was right when Baker came out with a seven speed nobody was really doing twin cam fxrs uh, a buddy of mine locally keith cole was the one that turned me on to the whole twin cam fxr yeah. deal and he's kind of the one that, that gave us a formula for how to how to make it how to swap the drivetrain yeah. and set it up yeah uh, and from there it just snowballed you know and then i, I bought a rt off of a buddy of mine and I was like, fuck it, dude, there's no twin cam RTs that are done. Mm-hmm. So we started building two twin cam FXRs at the same time. Going back to Skip, Skip had made these side covers, these really bitching side covers back in the 80s. And apparently he was, the story that he told me was that that he was working with the Nesses to, to try to get them into production. Something happened, the Nesses went a different direction, you know, hence the, the Ness side covers. Uh, and Skip had his, which were more of like, they don't like seat into where the side covers normally, yeah. they kind of sit on the outside. Uh, but he offered to give me the molds and the, mm-hmm. the original hand drawn instruction sheets for him and, and this and that, because he just wasn't gonna do anything with it anymore. You know, he had, he had done small runs in the nineties and stuff like that, but he just wasn't going to pursue it. He saw how passionate I was about that stuff. So he just offered it up. Nice. Didn't want anything in return, you know? And we produced those for a while until the molds kind of got fucked up. And now we're working with a a good friend of ours in California. Uh, I won't name any names right now until they come out, but they're retooling those molds for us so that we can come out with those side covers again. That's cool. Yeah. And the story of Skip is on our website. You know, so you can kind of go in there and check it out. But that's kind of how it started. That was like the the first little FXR part. Mm-hmm. And then, it, you know, just we just wanted to, from there, just start offering stuff that wasn't really available in that yeah. market. 
Yeah, I was scrolling down the website and looking at a lot of the things. Like, I I see how you started picking out things that are kind of get scarce. Right. You know, and and, and finding things to replace them with and things. That's that's really helpful. And and that was the the thing, too, is we got into handlebars. But our biggest thing was we didn't want to make handlebars like all the other stuff that was out there. Yeah. You know, we wanted to do our own thing, set our own stuff. You know, we we just wanted to put ourselves on a on a different level. You yeah, know? exactly. And and it's just one part after another after another. We have, you know, you guys have an integrity is why you found a design that fit and became you know what largely is what you're probably known for is the bars. Yeah, for I mean, the you part. you walk up on a on a set of those bars. Oh, those are FXR division bars. Yeah, you, you yeah you know exactly where they so, came from and stuff. There's been a few copycats, but <laughs> so you get they've to come this. And gone. You get to this point, right? So you start this set, you do all the LLC, you do all the shit, right? And then you take the vacation. Yeah. Like, what were you like in the, in, what was your role at the time and how did you kind of like skate through? I mean, obviously I know you skate through, but what was going on with you? I mean, uh, he got, he kind of just got everything dumped on him. <laughs> and my wife was a victim of that too, you know? And I was, I was kind of bad about not being that well prepared because mm-hmm. it all just kind of came he, he was heavily in denial and thought that it was gonna <laughs> yeah I, I, it was I, literally the last time we talked like i you know in the day free, before. free air and it was a day he was on you were on your way to oh, he stopped by to drop some stuff off like you've been down you've been down the day before but he stopped by just like last minute on his way over to the courthouse all right well i'll, I'll call you in a little bit thought for no, sure no that that it was gonna it was gonna turn out okay. a different yeah. way and you know it was a you know it was a hug and a handshake and a all right well, I'll talk to you in a little bit and then seven hours later I get a crying phone call from his wife you know so yeah it was like all right well that didn't work out and then at that point yeah it was it was a roller coaster of shit for a handful of months and then mm-hmm. things started to kind of smooth out and then uh, I, I don't know my you know I just kind of kept everything more I guess at a at a at a low low simmer. Yeah. So it was still there. You know, my wife was huge in helping me with the shipping and the and the customer relations stuff. But again, as I said earlier, I'm not a, not a salesman. Yeah. Not great at, at customer relations. Yeah. So there was a lot of, of shortcomings on that end of it. And you know, we didn't push sales. Didn't just again just kept it kept the existence kept there, but and kept it like I said at a, at a low simmer. And then as soon as he got out, it was at full force. So when when, back when, when did you officially get out? Uh, my official release date was April of last year. Damn. 18. Oh, okay. But I was, I was, uh, oh, okay. So it was about two years. So the, the, the whole term was four and then I was out right at around three cause there was okay. a, a year of home confinement. Oh, yeah, I was going to ask you if you had to do a halfway, halfway house, house and all shit, that yeah. other shit. Yeah. yeah. My boy in NorCal did that shit. They had all those, uh, lots of grow houses and lots of people involved and then, it was medically legal. Dude, it's a fucking racket. Yeah. I mean, and I'm not, without getting into it, it's just a fucking racket. Yeah. So. And he, he, we were, that's when, I, that was my NorCal Connect with work. So I was up there all the fucking time. And he was kind of the same way, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. Like, nah, dude, I, I, I'm going to go in there for a month. I'll be out next week. They don't, they're not going to take me to jail. They're making it legal. They're going to drop the case, all this shit. And then he goes in for two years. And no, it wasn't, it wasn't that I was in denial about what was impending it was that like we were trying to get the sentencing rescheduled so that i could actually get affairs in order and Mm -hmm. stuff like that and i thought for sure that that we weren't going to have an issue oh and then right when i get in there i just have this bitch of a judge that (laughs) you know was bringing up all kinds of shit that wasn't even relevant Mm -hmm. you know and making me out to be like this fucking evil person and stuff like that and actually she ended up tacking more time on to my sentence it was only a couple months but i wasn't walking out of there you know so nice yeah nice but so when you got out then obviously you know last year it's like you can tell you know the, the presence on social media uh jumping into the 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 m8 or the the soft tail build, you know, like that was got to be right around the same time that started popping off, huh? No, uh, that was, he was out. Because that Born Free out. last year was when you brought this bike. Yeah, yeah. this this last year. year. Yeah, well, not this not this year. It would have been. Last uh, Born Free. What the fuck is this? 19? Yeah, 19. 19. Yeah, 18. So you got out in 16? 
No, 17. Okay, 17? so. Yeah, because I was a year halfway house in home confinement. So it was April of 17, and then my official release from all that shit. Was April. Was April of 18. All right, so yeah, so then, then last year. And then Born year. Free, yeah, Born Free was what, June or whatever? Yeah, that's right. So we, yeah, were, so we were doing all that. But, yeah. I mean, the upside, the upside to it all was I had a lot of fucking time to think you know mm. doing fucking laps on the track or doing whatever to and brainstorming ideas and this yeah. and that so that when i came back it was just like you had you could apply it like you almost got a reset basically or you pretty much did yeah it didn't feel like a reset at first <laughs> it was it was a big adjustment and for like shit for the first year back i mean both Justin and I and, and this business, I mean, we worked 50, 60 hours a week mm -hmm. for free for like over a year, mm. you know, just trying to keep shit going and progressive yeah. movement, taking every dollar that was coming into the business and putting it back into the business to get to a point where we are yeah. now, you know? So you, you guys had already built that road glide before Born Free last year, right? Which one? The road glide with the aluminum tank. The plate the frame, plate frame bike. bike. Yeah. Is that? Yeah, that started. What you have at Hot Bike Tour 17? That the bike was there. Plate okay, frame bike. that's what I remember seeing. Yeah, so that, so Fonz's road glide, the, the road glide is what we called it. That's the one with just the black tank, and aluminum yeah. rear fender, aluminum dash. You know, that was an actual road glide. Yeah. That's the first one we did, and we did that one in 2015. Okay. So that was done, I think, June or July 2015, somewhere around in there. And that was kind of the start of it. Mm -hmm. And from that point, it just, yeah, I don't know, as my brain normally does, it just went full fucking retard. And <laughs> it went into this whole thing where it had an idea to do the, a, a chromoly frame, frame or something. I originally wanted to do a titanium frame. Yeah. Then I realized that, that was tens of thousands of dollars out of our budget. So yeah. that wasn't gonna fucking happen. So just kind of trying to backtrack and figure out how to make something just, again, just just you know ridiculous, but yeah. didn't look ridiculous. So that plate frame bike, you know, I remember cause uh, Big Joe ended up doing something with that, didn't he? Or helped or-, or No. Got, cause that's who he was ta talking to you whenever I came with you and Born Free this year. You and Big Joe were standing there. Yeah, yeah, you know, I've known Big Joe for a handful of years now. Yeah. Um, great fabricator as <laughs> yeah, well yeah he is um now joe had he ended up doing something similar okay and that's uh, that's probably what we were we were talking about was, yeah. was he was kind of getting back on that project so when, when we had started the the plate frame bike like it was just like i said kind of an idea and i had kind of pieced it all together in my head and then was trying to get it figure out how to get it in into a, a reality state um so we worked with with you know our good buddies at Trophy Engineering, Carrie and those guys over there, and he has an engineer on on staff. And I basically, I, I borrowed a frame, a frame from uh, Porum mm -hmm. at CMP, and then was trying to find a drawing or something. And Porum ended up helping us out with getting a, a you know a file that had some some of the factory. Um, geometry and stuff on it for, yeah. the, for the bagger frame so then we weren't starting from absolutely nothing so I, I sat there with with uh, Mike the uh, engineer at, at trophy and just measuring and going over and and he would make things to where it was strong and functional and I would say yeah no it looks like dog shit yeah and how do we make it look good he said, well, it has to be this I don't give a fuck it has to look good too so yeah. it was a you know a battle between him and I to make it yeah exactly functional and and strong and obviously I understand when things have strength and when they don't and whatever else. So, but it was just a, most of those guys don't understand, uh, uh, they don't care about how it looks. Yeah. And I'm one of those people that, unlike most people, they, they go for functionality and then try to make it look good. Yeah. I have an idea of how it needs to look in my head and then I figure out how to make that idea functional. Exactly. That's, so, I, li I like that because that's, Right. If I was gonna, if I was a fabricator, that's why I would do things. Right. Too, you know. And it's, it's, also, it's also a curse. It's a fucking yeah. curse, absolutely. And it, it and that's not to say that, that we ever stop short of functional to keep that look, but we just figure out how. I I, I, how I, I don't there. give up. Like I'm not gonna yeah. stop. Like this is how it needs to look. And if you tell me that it can't, that it's never gonna be functional. Okay. Well, fuck off. I'll figure out how to make it yeah. functional. You know. <laughs> like this. 
so anyway, so yeah, it was lots of time sitting there with that, and then it was it was planned for uh, Hot Bike Tour 2016 is when the bike was originally supposed to be done. The whole idea of the whole plate frame bike was that we could water jet it, press break all the pieces. I could do a little bit of welding with the fixture that we had designed, do a little bit of welding, and basically bolt the whole thing together because it's three separate pieces that it goes together in. Yeah. Not in the slightest did it ever go together in the way that I thought it was going to. It was <laughs> a thousand hours more work. I could have yeah. built 10 round tube frames in the time that it took to build that one plate frame. Yeah. Well, the thing of it was too is that it, it sat here in pieces because it, it was a multi multiple piece type of deal. Mm -hmm. And then we, we got rain or something. I wasn't even that we got rain. I had that motherfucker. You know when it was all rusty? Yeah, well, it was all pretty. The frame, all the metal was, yeah. was nice looking one day and then the next day we come into the shop and it's fucking orange. No, it went to, what that was, was it needed a battery box as the last piece that it needed. So rather than try to hand make a battery box, I just, you know, I ran it over to Trophy and sat with Fernie and we, we you know, he drew up a, designed up a battery box and he water jetted it and then we were gonna press break it the next morning and we set the, we set it on the table. We don't use, you know, swamp coolers are, are yeah popular here <laughs> uh, we don't use swamp coolers in our shop because it rusts bare metal right. like yeah. this thing I, I had it just it was full scotch brighted like everything was fucking perfect wiped down everything else well the table we sat it on we didn't realize was underneath didn't pay attention to the fact that it was directly underneath the the, uh, the cooler yeah so the next morning I'm intending just to go over there grab the battery box from from them and then come back here and he just we were gonna you know Bolt press it. break it all up test fit it make sure it worked and they come back here weld it in and be done i get a picture from carrie at like 6 30 in the morning fuck dude we didn't even think about the coolers it was a cheeto yeah. the whole thing was a fucking cheeto and they, you know, all the nooks and crannies of, yeah. of where that thing was i was like oh because i originally intended to stain the frame do like yeah. a chemical stain on it and then do like a matte clear there with that idea so that at that point it, it went and got sandblasted and and Cerakoted. and seracoded <laughs> That yeah. sucks, man. Yeah. So yeah, it, it was it was intended to be the the hot bike build for sixteen, and then it was intended to be the hot bike build for seventeen, and then it ended up being. Uh, it, it was. It made it, it to made the hot bike. It made it to the hot bike tour seventeen, it it, but it in, made it in a, in a trailer. In a trailer, yeah. and we pushed it, it who'd in. Roll, who'd y'all ride up up to uh, Tennessee with that that year? That year we drove, uh, we drove yeah. ourselves out. Yeah, oh, my, yeah. my dad, my dad and I. And Casey, okay, we all headed out, going that you know drove that direction. Then my brother flew into Nashville. And we picked him up there, um, and then yeah, from there and then yeah, then uh, Casey and I drove all the way back. So when when like who approached you with the uh, the Harley project? You know like was that something through Jeff Holt or San Diego? Or nah, yeah, that was. Yeah, Chris uh, got a call from from Mikey, Mikey San oh, from, Diego. Yeah. yeah, and and um, Mikey was like. Hey, we got put in charge of uh, the what anniversary? The 115th anniversary build off for this, yeah. and uh, we really want you guys to be a part of it. Would you be interested? It was a fucking no brainer. We were like, hell yeah, yeah, you know. So uh, he said, all right, cool. They'll be in touch. We'll figure out the bike situation, this and that. Uh, and then we just waited, mm -hmm. and then we waited some more, and we waited some more because we we're, we're, we're supposed to have the bike by Thanksgiving, right? And then Christmas like seventeen came, and then yeah, when did we get it? It was a January. Yeah, we got it end of February of two thousand eighteen. So yeah. like, and it was supposed to be ready for born free. Yeah, and so, then some of the some of the other guys because they ha already had established relationships with their dealerships because they'd been part of that build before. And I think maybe the dealerships were completely aware that they were they were going to get compensated for that bike. They were able to get their bikes early, whereas uh, we were working with our local dealership, which we have a really good relationship with. But they weren't going to do anything until the paperwork came through yeah. type of deal. So we, we already felt like we were a little bit behind on that. But it, it gave us time to – we had a direction and a plan before we, we even got the bike. So how how did you come up with uh, like you recreated a fairing basically? Right. You know it kind of looked like a road glide and an FXR T fuck and then this thing came out mm -hmm. and then you 
That was the point. Yeah, <laughs> that was the point. And it was, we they, just, had, they had a menage a trois with a, yeah. with a right. you know, an eight, 80s and we were, CBR. We were, we were yeah. doing the whole, what would Harley do in the MotoGP world yeah, type yeah. of deal, you know? So that's where the fairing came in. We had to narrow yeah. it down a lot and then... Y'all got the Fat Bob, right? Or which one did y'all yeah, get? Yeah, we picked yeah, right. the Fat Bob yeah. because of the 28 degree rake. One nice. the rake and the gas tank. Right. That was the only reason we. Cause I did, yeah, I cause they, they gave us a list. They gave us a, a questionnaire thing, and they said, you know, and you know, pick your three. Pick your top three that you want. And we've said, Fat Bob, Fat Bob, Fat Bob. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck off. We don't want anything other than that. Yeah. Love no, it came up. So, what was the fairing made of? Was it just all like uh, shaped metal, or did you kind of like do a lot of molding with like? Fuck no. <laughs> Some idiot, we won't point any fingers in the room, uh, decided that it would be a great idea to build it out of wire. So I'd done wire frames, yeah. like, you know, with, working with Christian Sosa, it's also metal works and stuff. That's where I learned the whole wire frame thing. That's, that dude's fucking rad. Too. Oh yeah. yeah. You know, prior to that, everybody made, you know, wood bucks and all that kind of things. And, you know, and he showed me, hey, you make this wire frame. It's, you know, you just basically MIG weld TIG wire together and shape out what you want. And then as you're shaping, unlike a traditional style buck where you just you kind of just push on it and see where your highs and, and spots yeah. are or whatever like now you can look in on the back side of it and you can see where it is or isn't touching your your form basically yeah. so i thought it would be a great idea to do a wireframe of a full bearing with lowers and all this yeah. stupid shit and it was i, I think it started i started with three different ways i started originally i was like oh, i'm gonna do the lowers and build my way up yeah and then I was like, all right, I'm gonna do the top and build my way down. Well, then I, but I can never figure get out a connection to... point or how to tie to the next piece or whatever. So then I figured like, all right, I had to start at basically like the you know the, the center belt line between the top radius and you know down where the where the headlights and everything mount going from there. So I started with that and then built up and down from that. Mm -hmm. But it was. I don't even know how many hours I have in that a stupid lot, fucking thing. A lot of hours. Days and days well, then, then and days was and to, days. Trying to figure out how we were going to wrap it, like what the final finish was going to be. Because uh, you guys have always stayed away from like custom paint. You've always kind of been more like of a... Downplayed, yeah. 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 Less is more, simplistic, yeah, kind of cla real classic we're, type we're shit. We're big on the, the less is more. Mm -hmm. and, and luckily we've, you know, we've, we've, had the benefit of having a not only a super good friend but a super talented painter mm -hmm. in Andy at Flying Iron Designs. Yeah, dude, him for, that dude's rad, man. He, I'm a big fan of him. He, uh, I mean, he's just super like-minded. Mm -hmm. You but, know, he's he's another. He just he gets in there and he gets shit done. He's a family guy, super humble, super talented. Yeah, yeah. you know, and we can tell him, we can tell him what colors we want or what we don't want, and. And he gets, and we can explain something to him, or I could send sheet metal to him and just draw out how I want the line work to be and tell him what I don't want, mm -hmm. and he'll make it happen. I mean, nice. Super, super easy to work with, but just talented. Yeah, so how do, you, how do you like that whole deal that they're doing? Like, what was your, is it a pop, do you like it? You think it's good for the industry? What Harley's doing with that stuff? I mean, giving the builders the opportunities or? Uh, absolutely. How could it not yeah. be, really? I mean, if you look at their new models that they're coming out with, mm -hmm. you know, it, and compare them to, to shit that the builders have actually produced. Yeah. You know, that they're, they're following a yeah. formula. So are you allowed to talk about the sitting down and talking to Harley guys? Or was I not supposed to say? Uh, not any details of details, it but like just yeah they really the just basically of, they do focus groups and stuff all yeah. the time um and they you know did like a focus group deal and we were we we're a part of it yeah i thought so, that was cool because it's really you know it's such a it's such a company that you don't mm -hmm. see any inner workings of from the outside consumer standpoint so right you know there's a lot it's like a lot of uh urban legends and myths and ideas and you know maybes and maybe nots and you know, to hear that they they do actually uh, take into consideration, like... Well, that was the first one that they, they told us it was the first time they'd ever sat down with builders or anything like that and asked opinions. Yeah, mm -hmm. or, it's or people relevant in the industry. Relevant to the industry, yeah. It's, nice. it's typically, you know, the, the enthusiast yeah, that they're certain, asking. Certain age demographics. Right. Geographical demographics, all that. Right. And not, not people with 
more intimate knowledge of yeah it goes back to like something we've been kind of promoting is that some of the best brand ambassadors and influencers in our new age is guys like yourself who are the trendsetters for you know building bikes and and setting the kind of trends that i mean maybe maybe the ha guys from the this running around t-bar set that trend but it's how you customize and made these parts available that's helped carry the trend into a market you right. know what i mean we feel that we've always as a blessing and a curse as well as we've always kind of been ahead of it yeah or just oh, forward. I, I, we're, could we're just, I could see it i could see how we're just forward um, thinkers you know yeah, we, forward we, thinkers yeah we, we don't we don't like to, we don't we feel awkward if we're stuck yeah. you know and we're, we're not af- we're not afraid to throw shit against the wall and try something right. out and if it yeah. works it works and not like your your ability to have learned and fabricated in the automotive world which you know you could probably agree that the automotive world is way more far advanced in a Absolutely. lot of the things they do than the motorcycle world so Absolutely. having that being able to be in that world and think about this world you're definitely going to be thinking ahead you're going to be a forward thinker for sure so yeah well it's on both sides of it too on the fxr side on the torch side as well i mean you look where the style is starting to come around now. I mean, we, on the tour side, we've been in that space for 15 years. Yeah. And now it's it's popular or becoming yeah. popular. Uh, you know, we were talking about earlier, there's mm-hmm. a ton of people that are that are you know, styling their things off of stuff that we did 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and just there wasn't as much of a social media presence right, that there it wasn't could be much that a, available. Right. There wasn't much of a social media presence. And again, it's all in this day and age, it's all about who, who, who hollers the loudest. Yeah. And, you know, and who's the one that's standing up telling everybody that they did it first and they're the one doing it rather than because you're going to take that at, at, at well, what it is instead of instead of actually doing research. And if you're new to it and you don't know these individuals, then, you know, why, I, I, why do they have a reason to? to, to I, I see the know? way that it like I see why it would be bothersome. You know what I mean? It for for the respect amongst your peers in this industry. Right. But I also see that like I, I think that half the public just doesn't give a shit. No, I you absolutely know? agree. They're I like, I don't give a fuck who did it first. It's right. Like, you know what I mean? And that's right. that. That's why, like, I think most absolutely. of us are more probably looking for, like, the mutual respect between other people to be like, hey, you know what? You know, paying homage to the people that created or sparked the idea or, you know, whatever the case may be. Yeah, so. And I mean, if you really break it down to it, like we were talking about earlier, too, none of us created any of this shit. Yeah. We're all regurgitating shit. Like, everything that, that we do on the Torch side and on the FXR side, it's all it's just our own new take on things that were done yeah. years ago. Like you know, all the long fender bikes and everything that we do, it's just a, it's just an extension of the guys that were riding with a pangers and 21s and in yeah, all across the country. And it, now it's, it's being more labeled as like a, a low rider or a Hispanic thing or whatever. But the reality of it is in the sixties and seventies, there was guy, there was old gray beard, white dudes with, 18 inch, 21 inch tall apes and a 21 on the front with, with you know, fish long shell head fenders and fishtails on it, you know? Yeah. It's just. It's been adopted as, right. it's the Vikla culture now Correct. or the. the to other me, one. it's a custom motorcycle. We're all pulling from that custom scene, yeah. right? And it's, it's, I think on the tour side of things, everything that we do is, it's not, it doesn't fall under one genre mm-hmm. because it's, it's just, it's like the custom car culture. It's just you pull styling from everything it's like it doesn't matter it's the same thing on the well, fxr it's like side with the foundry how you had all these different styles of cars and, and right. shit in there and cars was... and bikes and everything and, and even on the on the fxr side you get guys that ride fxrs and dynas and they're all all performance motorcycle only bro fuck the you know mexican bikes or fuck that shit whatever but they got panel painted paint jobs on their shit they got fucking socks pulled up to their fucking knees with cut off dickies and wearing a Pendleton or whatever. Like, yeah. And a fresh white t-shirt. And a fresh white t-shirt and the whole deal. And, you know, with like, lo- with Loke style shades on, listening to oldies or rap going down the street. It's like, yeah. come on, man, for real? Like, it's <laughs> all, it's a, this, uh, this industry and this motorcycle culture and the car, car culture and everything else, it's a fucking melting pot. Yeah. You know I mean, it doesn't, we all pull style from everywhere. So to say, like we were, you know, we were talking about yesterday when you were by, guys in Sturgis talking shit about big wheel bagger guys mm-hmm. but you know those guys got a 23 inch front wheel on their bike or whatever you know what I mean like yeah well, they, they would talk like, shit about it like it was not like it was um it's the funny thing to do or the, or the like you know what I mean right I, that part I didn't gives, like so but yeah the, the, who gives a fuck we're all riding motorcycles exactly and it's, and it's, so why why singled out this one bike just because some of the guys that were riding it wore you know sparkly jeans you know what I'm saying right right it doesn't take away from the uh the the craftsmanship 
of some of the builds that Correct, took place yes. and some of the builders that have done some amazing <sighs> things in right. big wheels and in just in custom motorcycles right. period so well and, and that that guy that was talking shit about that big wheel bagger there's a good chance that he has a performance bagger or a performance bike that's got a full fucking stereo on it yeah you pulled that shit from the from the big wheel bagger guys and that's about as anti-fucking performance as it gets <laughs> speakers and all this you know amps and your bags and all this other shit like yeah, Again, it just, we all pull from everything, so there's no reason to like just be like, "Hey, fucking high five, man! Glad to see you here." Yeah, cool. You're that's, your motorcycle. that's that's what that's really what I want to promote. Even though I'm the biggest hypocrite because I poke fun at the big wheel shit all the time. I, you know, you we know, all, we're all it's guilty. It's low hanging fruit, man. We're all guilty. <laughs> we're all guilty of, of being hypocrites at times, for sure. But I mean, like, it, it's I don't know. It, I get what you're saying. I think it's uh, you know, I just wish people did look at motorcycles in a custom way and respect that more across the board. And, uh, you know, that's way, I don't know, that's what I think, so fuck it. <laughs> we don't have to click up. It's a, yeah. We can all we can all like motorcycles. That's me. Yeah. I like motorcycles. You can have like a diverse a Japanese group of bike bikes or a going down the road. European bike or whatever. I like, I like yeah. mechanical things. Yeah, I think that's another thing that we share real common here is that we're not just partial to one particular thing because we, we see different shit. I mean, even when we were, we were building that soft tail, I mean, we were pulling ideas from from all different types of of styling cues and, and genres and race bikes and and this period and that period and and just trying to put our own particular take yeah. on. And that goes back to what we were talking about over the you know the breakfast while ago is about you know we can pay homage to all these like cultures of the '70s and '60s and '80s and '90s and 2000s. But we have to focus on being innovative and creating our own culture to be remembered and respected for the next couple of generations. Right. You know, and I think that, yeah, you guys definitely do it. You you kind of, you know, doing that soft tail, you kind of looked at it with a fresh set of eyes. And unfortunately, some things in the industry just work, you know, T-bars just fucking work, right. you know. So you kind of got to stick to some of those things that work, but trying to find the styling cues to kind of create a new look. They can still be performance rather than just going like kit like fxrt fairing well the, the nice thing the that nice thing about that soft tail build was that we weren't we weren't building that bike to promote our new parts line mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying we built that bike because we had an opportunity to to do our own vision yeah like a one-off custom soft tail how we would do it you yeah. know with with no ceiling because that was the first question hey is yeah. there a you know what do what we can't have we do yeah what can't we do was our question yeah you know and when we didn't get an answer we were just all right if, yeah. if, yeah. if we get if we get bitched at you know then we'll just apologize but yeah you know don't ask permission yeah, we, we right. didn't we didn't have you know it was nice not having a ceiling yeah. you know and it was also nice when you looked at that lineup it, it was refreshing to see that that there were bikes in that lineup that were totally different than any other bike in that lineup you know, mm -hmm. so that's that's what's really nice when you when you can get put into uh, that situation and you can go down a lineup and and know that yeah each individual group took their own thought, their own feeling, their their heart, put it in it. You know, and none of them look the same. You know, because yeah. they all have their own vision, their own perception, and that's what they came up with. Yeah, that's uh, I mean, that's well said, man. What uh, what do you think uh, moving forward? Like, you know, starting next year, I mean, you're gonna get involved in any more of those kind of builds with Harley, or you think you will, or? Well, I mean, we won't say no. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. You know, that's, it, nothing's been you brought just to the table. Nothing's, brought to, time. <laughs> yeah, nothing's been brought to the table currently, but I mean, I yeah. not say that it wouldn't be. So what yeah. do you think? Not say that we wouldn't do I, it. I mean, even even when it comes down to it, like we can make it happen. You know, yeah, it's nice to have more time. But then also when you're given more time, it, it could also be a crutch too, because then you take you advantage of take that, it, yeah. you know? And That's not might, I absolutely yeah. will take advantage yeah, of it. Yeah, it, sometimes <laughs> it's good to have, uh, you Pressure. Know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, it's all, maybe it's also good too, to like kind of, you know, conceive a little bit of the uh, direction you'd want to go, kind of like what you said you did originally. And, um, you know, I don't know, I think, I think it'll come back around for you guys. I mean, it seems like the business, the, the brand is growing. You know, and then, you know, you got the new facility coming. Yeah, we could talk yeah. about some of that part, yeah. but yeah. So the new facility, man, we drove by a while ago and that's just going to be, I'm looking forward to coming back to Phoenix to fucking, you know, check that thing out once it's rolling. Yeah. We're, 
pretty excited to get over there. Yeah, so what, so do you think about any more? I mean, you're you're making the bars for yourselves and plus other brands out there in the industry, mm-hmm. right? And then you have your uh, the the bags with the rails, which I saw all of them packed up, ready to roll. I mean, any other kind of like parts lines you're you're thinking about making for the FXR division brand or? Yeah, we have a handful of parts that we're kind of working on, but again, it's you know being a small company, it's hard. We don't have a lot of you know, that working capital that it takes to put yeah. into that, as well as not even necessarily the working capital is the time. Yeah, right. Because it's it's as far as FXR division goes, it's Chris and I. Yeah, you know, so between building regular orders and emails and phone calls and shipping and and yeah, just I mean, regular customer builds customer builds and, and i mean dude you got some fucking shit. killer ass bikes on the lift I, I i didn't even see this black out fxr i was just i was touching everything because the powder coat's perfect everywhere i was like fuck this thing is fucking cherry yeah, and that's, uh that's each look. time i've come here you've been right there on that desk packing orders you know yeah and I, you were still, as soon as i walked in i just fucked your whole day of, of actually getting <laughs> anything done that's all right <laughs> I'll just be here later. That's yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, man. That's I don't know. It's it's cool, man. I like seeing these bikes, man. I like seeing the shit you're doing. Hopefully, you guys are gonna get better at posting stuff on social media. So yeah, we're trying we to. <laughs> we're trying to. I mean, we even yeah. talked about having a buddy of ours who's a really good photographer. You know, trying to trying to handle some of that for us. But then you, at the same time, you kind of lose who we are. Yeah. Because when we post, you, then you're getting it from us and our take and our feel. Yeah. on it and when you're yeah. paying somebody to do it you, you lose that well if you find somebody that does that kind of shit but then they they are somebody that is you consider a friend and they kind of get you which is like we were talking about at lunch with the uh get the chicks in there selling the stuff that right. knows about motorcycle parts you know right they might just not exist you know whatnot right so, a lot of badass photographers and videographers but not all of them are into bikes yeah, yeah. Well, and plus if, if we hire somebody else to do it then you know who's going to get to read my snarky, smart-ass comments that only four people understood anyway, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. That's fun. Well, uh, shit, so... Yeah. Uh, as far as, like, I guess, parts and stuff, though, yeah, we, we're trying to develop some of the uh, um, performance bagger stuff that we had yeah. done on builds in the past, and, again, now it's kind of become the popular thing, and we're now just trying to figure out how to make some of that stuff a producible part and there's a lot of people trying to do the same shit that we're already I think that we're doing and you know like there's so there's so much and I like I we have me and you guys have not even off air talked anything about the performance bagger stuff but mm-hmm. there's so many things that that I feel like could be addressed and, and and customized but it feels like a lot of people are jumping to the same products and making yep. the same products with the new logo on it Yep. And you know it's like it's almost like we have enough of these right here, bro. We need, we need. To look at this bike. You can't find anything else to kind of like, right? Put some flavor to you. Know and what that's I mean? that's another one of my downfalls too. Is like when an idea, you know, happens. Yeah. I guess. In my mind, how the fuck am I the only person that's thinking of this? Like it can't. Yeah. I can't be the only one that's searching this. So then it becomes like an internal race. Like we got to get this shit done. We got to get it done now before somebody else fucking does this. Yeah. And like. It, it's a constant. Yeah, I it's get a, it's it, yeah. a battle because it, it's totally different if it's something we come up with that's totally different. But also, like I'm not the only person that has thought of this. Or, you mm-hmm. know, when Chris comes to me, he's like, "Hey, what do you think about doing this?" Fuck, let's do it. Mm-hmm. But then again, we run into that 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 issue of being small business owners and and regular so the life and trying and, to balance yeah. and everything else. Time, money, uh, money's a, a big crutch because the stuff that we want to do, it's not we can't do like ten pieces or 20 pieces or even a hundred pieces you know there's there's requirements in order because the stuff that we want to do it's it's there's full-on tooling involved there's heavy machinery involved there's cnc or laser shit involved you know and and all that takes time and money Mm -hmm. you know and we have the design and stuff like that it's just trying to strategically spend that money to where it's going to come back and yeah. it's going to benefit the business but allow us to put our ideas out there so that everyone else can enjoy them or utilize them you know for their own personal benefit yeah it's got to be hard i mean to i understand because i look at shit and i'm like fuck man like i you know i can take the fast life garage and apply a, a hard part to it but then i'm like well then i need to get an investor and 
Right. Then I got to come to a guy like you and say, this is what I'm thinking of doing this. And you already got shit on your plate. So now I'm, now I'm like, so by the time my shit comes into fruition, it's well down the line and I'm not even interested in the shit anymore. You know what I mean? Yep. So it's been, a, it's been a tough one for us too, trying to figure out ways to expand our brand and uh, into other things that we're interested in, you know? Yeah, and we're trying to keep it as organic as possible. You know, it's this business was started with the both of us. Yeah. We haven't taken any outside capital. We, we've grown the business off of the money that, from parts and sales that we've done and made, you know, and that we, we're, we're trying to keep it that way. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's a fucking struggle, but if if and when we make it happen there's nothing more rewarding than saying hey we did this all on our own accord and we don't have to answer to anybody who's mm -hmm. worried about getting their money back or whatever you yeah know? yeah we take the hit we take our medicine and we fucking move on i would think the shirts do good because the same thing i was telling tony from ranjet i was like man you should be proud of like you know like i'm telling you that people in texas dig your brand like ramjets and the same thing for fxr division i see those shirts fucking everywhere and I, I would feel, I mean, I don't sell shirts. I don't have anything. But I would feel so stoked to just be, like, at Born Free and see my shirts walking around. And I'm not, no, I don't know those guys. You know, they mm -hmm. don't really know who I am either. Yeah. You know, but it's like seeing it's, that shit. Yeah, it's funny. You go to go to places and you'd be standing in a group of people and they're wearing an FXR Division shirt. And you're standing, you know, you don't know them. They don't know you. And you're standing next to them. But <laughs> yeah. I think it's funnier not to say anything. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because yeah. what, what, what douchebags would be like, sick hat, bro. That's mine. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? The way but you said that, I, I've actually heard that in my life, and it is douchey as fuck. Right. right. It's fuck. Yeah. Yeah. Who does that? But they walk up, hey, man, nice shirt. Yeah. You know, it's me, right? Yeah. You want, you want a, like an autograph? Can I sign it? Yeah. A high five or something? Yeah, no, it's, it's cool as shit. I mean, uh, we had a buddy of ours send us a screenshot. He was watching. Yeah, I saw that. Final Four game or something like that. Yeah. yeah. And yeah was, we were trying to figure out who the fuck it was. Yeah. And it was well, on TV, was it right? Yeah. yeah, it was nationally televised. It was, it was a, it was a play, game. playoff, playoff game, game of some kind. And this guy's got killer seats, like courtside yeah, seats. Yeah, courtside seats, yeah. He was in the first and, or second row. And he's... He was sitting right behind the coach. Yeah, it was a Portland... Was it a Trailblazers? <laughs> Trailblazers, yeah. They're, 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 <laughs> anyway, the dude's got a full-on FXR Division hat. Yeah, just, red FXR Division hat yeah, and sunglasses they, on. So he was clearly trying to be incognito. <laughs> well, his future is so fucking bright, bro. Yeah, yeah well, you know. I mean, clearly he probably he's is somebody. Some good seats, we were trying to figure out who the fuck it was. But yeah, that's that, that's dude. That's so stoked. I, I'm looking forward to that that point too, so that I can figure out whether or not I'm going to be the hey, nice shirt, bro. Yeah, I did that, or yeah, yeah, you know, if it's just like you sit back in the cut kind of thing. Yeah, I don't know who I am yet. I it'll never find happen for <laughs> us. We're just not like that, no. you know. Yeah, we're just. I mean, rarely are we wearing our own shit. You know, we're usually wearing yeah, speed all of our, all, our, all of our friends' shit. You know, because yeah, that's we're we much rather support everybody else and sit there and well, yeah, okay so I feel it. bad because basically the last shirt uh, runs of shirts I did I just made like a, a stack of them that just said my, had my logo across the front and I just worked in them right oh we worked in our, our yeah, but see the thing is like I would get like a speed merchant shirt or FXR division shirt and that's my that's my my nice shirt I'm wearing that out right. on the town oh, yeah. absolutely you know I, I would rather like I've not, I'm, I totally have, but I don't like wearing my shit sometimes. Like as in, as in like uh, you know you're going out of town, so you're like fuck man. No one really knows what I look like, so I need to put the shirt on so people know that I'm Jace from the Fast Life. You know what I mean? Like right. I try not to think like that. Whenever we go places, like I I try to make it a point not to wear one of <laughs> our shirts for any of the brands because yeah, you were saying like it, well, not to say that I won't do it, but that I haven't done it before, but. Typically, like, I don't want to... Like, yeah. Shouldn't you be wearing your shirt? No. Yeah. Well, no. I'm, I'm, I'm totally going to be a hypocrite because my next shirts I end up doing, I'm totally going to wear them. But, you know, it, it's just kind of like... It's kind of like going back to, like, I'm proud of... If I if I do it and I actually make it happen, I'm, I'm going to be proud of it at least, you right. know? So, but, yeah, I do get the... Uh, it's kind of like... Uh, when we were doing, you know, when I was doing this ride with Yellow Wolf, and I'm not trying to talk shit about to do anything, but when he did the ride with him, we were all sitting down at this little, like, hole in the wall next to a gas station Mexican joint, eating some food, sitting at a table with him, all his friends, super cool guys. But his ringtone was his one of his songs, like a verse. Right, right. And I, I, it happened, and <laughs> <laughs> I'm eating, and then I'm eating my enchiladas and shit, and it happened. I looked up, and I tried to make eye contact with somebody, and everybody, like, 
did not look up. I'm like, oh, this must be a thing that everybody thinks, but there, it's not not a big uh, deal. Right. I would feel so weird, like yeah. I, because I, I was always taught, thought about that. Like if I was fucking Kanye West, you know what I mean? Like that would be so douchey to drive down the street with your top down in your Lamborghini, listening to Open the Kanye West. Yeah, yeah. Right. you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, that dude would do it though, because he's his own. He's his yeah, own greatest he's probably fan. the worst. Yeah, probably right. the worst example. But you know, right. you would have to kind of like enjoy yourself, it's like right. jerking off in the bathroom or something. You know, right? Yeah, you just got to do it behind your, behind everybody else's <laughs> back, basically. That's right. <laughs> yeah, it's wild, man. But dude, it's two thirty, man. I, I got to catch this flight soon. Oh yeah, yeah. We're yeah. about that. Sucks. Yeah, we just got to drive a couple miles home. So yeah. Well, hey, man, I really appreciate you guys doing it. I'm going to be back here in a couple months. You know, let's, let's hang out again and, you know. Absolutely. Do cool guy shit. Yeah, yeah. you're really welcome here anytime. <laughs> so FXR Division on Instagram, Torch Industries. Like, how do you how do you dot and hashtag all, this, all this at shit? At FXR Division and at Torch IND. Mm. Website. Is, is it connected to the Instagram, the website? Yeah. yeah or is both, it its own both, thing, yeah. too? Okay, yeah. cool. Well, fuck, man, thanks. Yeah. Let's do this. Peace. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you guys enjoyed that. I uh, want to thank Justin and Big Chris there for sitting down and doing it in the middle of the day and also for the ride to the airport. Justin, appreciate that, sir. Uh, looking forward to hanging out with you in SEMA and uh, getting you and uh, Brian from TPJ on this podcast. So anyway, thank you guys and thank you to Simpson Motorcycle Helmets on Instagram as well as SimpsonMotorcycleHelmets.com. Dream Rides John on Instagram and TeamDreamRides.com and Fast Life at checkout for 10% off. Big Bear Choppers on Instagram at BigBearPerformance.com, and you can always give Kevin a call at 909-478-7788. Paint Huffer Metal Flake on Instagram at PaintHuffer.com and FastLife12 at checkout for 10% off. Thundermax EFI on Instagram and ShopTMax.com, and of course Lex and Moto on Instagram and LexandMotorcycle.com, FastLife at checkout for 15% off. Thank you guys again for you know this month uh it's our highest downloaded month it's our highest listened to month and i appreciate that and um really looking forward to it so you guys please continue to tell your moms and your friends and your sisters and your brothers about this podcast and let's help it grow uh you know listener wise and get it into more people's ears and you know i'm working on myself every time we do this podcast to get better at interviewing and learn you know i've been listening to some of these podcasts recently and 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 being so annoyed with myself so all you guys out here that enjoy this podcast thank you because i can't stand listening to myself so and some of you probably can't stand listening to me either so you know i appreciate you guys sticking through this while i uh, i get better hopefully so anyway thank you guys uh we'll probably have a week off next week during sema but we'll be back with some uh some good shit so stay tuned and you guys have a good uh halloween and you know rest of the week <laughs>